Thanks. I don't know how they do it. I'm sure you're a natural. If you're ever interested in a career change, let us know. We can help you with that path. We, me and Emmy are having daily arguments, daily, <laughs> like multiple, more than one. Yeah, that, that is a common trend that uh, it is definitely a transition for a family that they navigate this, no, no doubt, yeah. common theme. Like what happened, like, like she just flat out refuses to like do stuff. Like, I mean, I, I, I don't know how to maneuver from there. Like, I don't have the skills for that. Stuff that you know that if <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm mostly like, do it now because I told you to do it. That's kind of, and then from there, I, I don't know where to go. I don't know. Last board meeting when there was some uh, commotion in the background and you muted for 10 seconds, then it, you turned back on and there was no commotion anymore. I, yep. I was pretty impressed with that. So whatever that method is. <laughs> That's happening a lot lately. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hey there. Are we ready to get started? Let me just make a quick glance at our attendance here, make sure we have all our board members and student reps. Okay, looks like we have everyone uh, here. Awesome. Well, so I'm calling our work session into order. And our first item that we have for our work session is our Hillsborough Library presentation with Travis Ryman. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I am here to introduce a team of folks who will share an awesome project with you. Um, first, we have Vanessa Ceccarelli, who is our own um, media specialist and librarian for the district. We have Linda Osuna from the city of Hillsborough, who also serves in our uh, citizen or er, community curriculum advisory committee. Um, and they'll be making the presentation tonight, but I also wanted to acknowledge from Washington County Cooperative Library Services, um, Crystal Trice and Katie Anderson, as well as Becky King-Smith, who is our coordinator, our director of secondary education, um, who have supported this project and are here to answer questions after the presentation. So thank you to the whole team for making this happen. Take it away, Vanessa and Linda. Thank you. Thank you for finally, finally we've arrived, right? Uh, this project has been going on uh, for several years now, so I'm happy this is just, this is really exciting. So um, I'm just so glad we can share this with you all. And Vanessa has been a great partner uh, in working with, uh, with Hillsborough Public Library as well as uh, Washington County, they've been phenomenal in getting this project started. So without uh, further ado, let's get this party started. Um, actually, the first slide is um, is the old name of our account, uh, which we sh what we have up here is called the Youth Access Card Project. Um, initially, it did start off like that, but since it's evolved into something that's countywide and available for all students, it's now called the Youth Access library account because the main difference is there's no physical card. So the beauty of this program, as you'll see, is that now students, in particular students at HSD, can now use their student ID. So their account number that they would use to access would be HSD plus their six digit student ID number. Next slide, please. So this project began with the idea of how the public library could partner with Hillsborough School District um, about three and about what can we do to support. And as you know, the city of Hillsborough has been a great partner. Uh, we're always looking to see how we can support the school district and not only students, but also the families of our community. So what we collaborations develop into a larger, more collaborative partnership, but now with WCCLS. And now the student card or the student account, the YALA, you'll, you'll hear me say that YALA, has now evolved into a countywide student uh, success initiative. Uh, currently it's already serving other students in other districts, but 
What's more important is now it's coming to Hillsborough and we're ready for it. And City of Hillsborough and the library, this is a shining moment in our continued support of students of HSD. All the project completely aligns with the library's mission statement, which is for everyone or para todos. Very simple, direct and to the point. We love it. Next. So in addition to aligning with the city's uh, strategic plan, this project also aligned with uh, the WCCLS uh, services strategic plan, um, which there are 16 libraries, which include both Brookwood and Shoe Park branches here in Hillsboro. This YALA um, students will be able to use their, their account at all libraries within Washington County. And so we're really excited about that. Um, as you can see, those are just two of the objectives that uh, that this project or this initiative fulfills for WCCLS. Next slide. The Youth Access Library account will also support Hillsborough School District's strategic plan. So through the YALA, students will have more access to highly engaging print and digital resources to support literacy and meet the literacy benchmark goal. The access will provide more opportunities for reading, which will assist in closing the opportunity gap in language arts achievement. And both Hillsborough Public Library and HSD's digital reading collections include titles in English and Spanish in a variety of formats and genres. Next slide. The YALA also supports the district's new K through six language arts adoption. It supports increased opportunity for independent reading. Not only do students have access to their own school library collection, they will also have access to the public libraries, vastly increasing their reading options. Hillsborough Public Library has children's materials in 19 different languages and adult materials in six languages. YALA will provide access to an increased number of materials in both English and Spanish, which supports our growing dual language program. And lastly, it encourages and expands students' online access to digital ebooks and audiobooks. This is especially timely since we are in comprehensive distance learning. Students can still access reading materials even though they are at home. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the I, I apologize, the slide is incorrect, it's the YALA, the youth, youth Access Account um, card account or library account um, serves as a gateway to the public library, of course. We want students to get familiarized with the library. For some, they've been uh, totally familiar with the library, but for, for a lot of our students in the community, this is uh, the first time they'll be ever exposed to the um, public library and all the services that we provide. So and in order for us to uh, reduce barriers for the students and to get comfortable with using and thinking of the library as a resource, as I mentioned earlier, uh, WCCLS has uh, worked with uh, the school district to reduce that barrier. Instead of a traditional library card, which is 16 digits long, um, we they've developed a way for us to use uh, the the prefix of HSD, as, and as you can see, their six-digit student ID number. Um, again, the library card or the library account uh, can be used at any Washington County library, and there's 16 of them, as I mentioned before. And the reason I'm, at, uh, you know, you know, emphasizing the account because it is there's no card associated, so there's no risk of losing a card. Um, simply, if your student knows their six-digit student ID, they'll be able to, you know, let's just get past the, the pandemic, but I mean, uh, the idea is for them to come into the library, select materials, whatever they'd like, come in and check out by, the, um, by themselves using their self-check machines and simply key in their, uh, their HSD six-digit student ID. Um, for those, like I mentioned earlier, some students are already familiar with our library services, and that's completely fine. Um, they, they have a 16-digit um, card number, which will be fine when the uh, 
when the transfer of information goes through, those, those students will still maintain their 16 digit card number, but if they would want, if they want to reduce it and make it easier for themselves so they don't have to retain a physical card or even remember uh, that, that 16 digit, we can go ahead and convert those cards into um, a YALA and that'll be easy. Um, also, um, we're going to be looking at individual cases where maybe some students have, have uh, some fines associated with their account. We want to reduce every barrier possible for our students and basically give them a clean slate. So when we do this card, uh, this account for, this, for the students, we're going to go ahead and look at each individual account and see if we can clear all the fines and any other obstacles for them uh, library services. We're really excited about that. Uh, we, the city of Hillsborough is right behind it and um, WCCLS has been uh, an extraordinary partner in helping us get to that level of uh, service for our students. Next. So um, these are just the intricate details of the, the account, uh, the YALA card, the YALA, sorry. Um, You'll see in the darker blue, uh, this is, let's just say pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. This is, this is when a student can come into the library, right? So they'll be able to check out books and audio books. Um, they can place holds with their account. Um, they can also, there's no overdue fines on children's materials, which is something that WC Sales has implemented, uh, I believe in 2017. And they can also uh, renew their items um, as long as there's no other holes um, for their materials that they want. Online, which, you know, now we're here and now we're all online, our students are online, our children are learning. I heard some of the conversations before our presentation tonight. This is the perfect timing for this type of account. Um, I don't know if, if you want to talk a little bit about the Sora and how it's going to complement the Sora, Vanessa. Yeah, so um, this past January, we debuted our first ever digital library collection uh, for secondary students. And then in March, we rolled in elementary. And it's run through um, this app called Sora, uh, which is this, run by the same company, Overdrive, um, that uh, uses Libby, if you're familiar with that, at the public library. Um, so since then, students have had access to the district's digital collection, which includes ebooks, audiobooks graphic novels, picture books, and early chapter books in both English and Spanish. And our usage stats have skyrocketed since distance learning started. And as the word gets out, more and more students and staff are using the digital collection. Um, so we really love Sora because it is designed for schools and is designed to uh, be used by students. It includes accessibility tools and features and makes reading fun. Um, students get to earn digital badges uh, for, re for meeting certain reading goals. And then Sora also has a built-in feature to add a public library card. So students will access um, their YALA account by adding their number and password into the Sora app. And then they will be able to toggle between our collection and the Hillsborough Public Library's collection. Um, and Sora is accessible on Chromebooks and then also through um, any Android or iOS uh, device because it is an app and then mm -hmm. anyone with an HSD account can use it. So I'm always telling staff uh, to jump on and see what the latest great young adult books are. Next. So uh, details about the fines and fees. Um, as I stated earlier, in 2017, WCCLS, along with all our member libraries, uh, decided that uh, in order to reduce barriers, <clears throat> excuse me, in order to reduce barriers, we wanted to go ahead and remove any fines associated with children's materials, um, children's materials all the way through uh, young adult materials. So um, everything from cradle to, you know, senior in high school, all the materials from board books to uh, graphic novels, they're fine free. So that's that's one of the beauties of, of what we've been working towards and we were finally arrived at today. So um, the YALA also um, has audio books in addition to print books. Um, 
and also uh, e-content. I can tell you that our e-content has, um, has increased significantly or substantially since the onset of the pandemic. And they're very popular and they've increased the titles. And not only that, um, the sister libraries have all committed to go ahead and um, putting more uh, resource toward that collection or e-content. Um, once again, the e-content is fine free. Uh, once it's due and if you don't renew it, it just disappears off your device. So there's no worries there. Um, items that are, oh, oops, can we go back one slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So one of the things is uh, when we were talking with HSD is um, items that are, what, what happens when items are considered lost? Well, sometimes items, uh, you know, disappear and that's not just for uh, young people, that's for all people of all ages. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, those uh, items don't come back. So, you know, we at the library would, you know, again, trying to commit to reducing barriers we work with people all, all the time to go ahead and figure out ways to offset some of those costs associated with lost or damaged materials. Um, I can tell you that many times once they get that letter, that friendly reminder that your item is passed due, those items somehow trickle back to the library and those are wiped clean off their account. So uh, we felt, um, the Hillsborough Public Library felt that that was uh, very few and far between and compared to the benefits of having uh, a card or an account designed just for students to reduce those barriers. So for us, that's that's minimal. Ebooks and audiobooks, as you see, um, are not charge fines. Um, again, you can renew your items if they're on your uh, on your devices, on your computers, your laptops. Um, so those you can have them, renew them, turn them in early no problem, they won't be charged any fines and similar to any of the print materials for youth and uh, young adult items. Next. So what we're looking at here is a page off of WCCLS. Um, I, you know, I failed to mention uh, Washington County Cooperative Library Services, that's the acronym WCCLS. But what we wanted to show you here were some of the resources that are available and not only to students, but anyone who has a library uh, account with us. So what we're highlighting here is homework help. Now, uh, WCCLS has made um, a, a, a huge effort in developing and um, contracting with databases uh, services that, uh, uh, that support learning um, for all ages, but we're going to talk about students here. So some of the uh, online supports that we have here, if you would move to the next slide, that would be wonderful. So the, some, of the, some of the items that we do have available through WCCLS website is homework help and uh, some research um, research uh, information that we can go ahead and have students learn how to use. And what we're hoping is that we can partner with the school district in, in working with our teachers and our families to go ahead and utilize these, these resources. They're, uh, they're free, they're available with your account. Um, also, one important note is that WCCLS recently developed a beautiful, I'm, I apologize, I don't have a copy of the slide in my deck today, but they've designed a beautiful distance learning resources. So not only are the resources available here, but there's a beautiful landing page that they've developed um, for, our, for our families to use. I'll also add a quick note that um, this is also available for a lot of our homeschoolers too. So, but um, I just want to reintroduce this to um, our public library students or our public students uh, at HSD. Uh, one important piece also is um, there's an online live support uh, homework help called BrainFuse. It's online tutoring. It's free of charge, of course. And all you would need to do is access with your uh, YALA account. Um, Crystal, is there anything I need to add here? I'll, I, I want to add also that our entire WCCLS landing page 
is in Spanish format on the upper right hand corner. There is a feature uh, you can click on, it says Espanol, and everything translates uh, for um, Spanish language. Is there anything we want to add to that, Crystal? No, it sounds great. The distance learning pages are also broken up by grade level as well. So that's a help for families looking for extra resources. So, um, yeah, so there's all kinds of things. Uh, it's pretty nifty. We've got lynda.com on there. We have ancestry.com for those of you who are interested in that. Uh, we've got um, reading reference. Uh, what, what, I, what should I read next? All kinds of things. Uh, in addition to audiobooks, tumble books are on there, which is um, books that you that students could look at and read on their Chromebooks, follow along, and you'll still hear the books coming through. So it's it's a wonderful feature, and we're really excited to showcase that. Next slide, please. Hillsborough Public Library also supports early literacy for incoming kindergartners through focusing on the skills of talking, singing, playing, writing, and reading. And this practice prepares children for kindergarten where they may obtain their first yalla. Next slide. So this is my favorite part. Um, I, I've been in libraries for almost 20 years. I love Hillsborough Library. It's, all, it's, it's like, I've been at several different um, organizations uh, where I've worked at in public libraries and by far Hillsborough Library is the best. Uh, we're so fortunate to have this resource and we're really excited here, staff's excited. Um, we've enhanced, no longer is this a quiet, a quiet shushing library. We've never, we've never wanted to model that. What we want is a high energy, uh, we want it to be inclusive, We've designed spaces uh, for people to have quiet time if they need to study. We've designed um, uh, maker spaces. We call them collaboratories. We do have them available at Shoot Park and at Brookwood. Each one is unique in itself. Um, Brookwood is a maker space where it has different opportunities for people to come in, uh, families to come in and work on projects together. We have materials available. Shoot Park is equipped to be a recording studio. Uh, you can do a podcast recording there. Um, some other things that we're looking at is developing some uh, how-to classes um, online right now, um, online tutorials of how to use your devices. Um, read to the dogs. And right now, because of the pandemic, unfortunately, we are our newest and latest service. And one of our most successful has been called, is called HPL to go, which is basically a walk up service. So that means students can place items on hold, they can call us, they can do it online, place their items on hold, we'll send them an email or notify them however they uh, however they uh, prefer. And then they can come over to the library, which is either Shoot Park or Brookwood, and come over and pick up their materials um, and they're ready for them. Uh, it, we've made this a safe, uh, hands-free, touch-free experience. Um, it's very popular um, and we love it. This Just this week alone, we reopened it due to the, the smoke and everything. So we just relaunched it yesterday after being closed several days. And there's music out there, it's high energy, and that is what we want. We want kids to get excited about libraries again. Next slide, please. Well, the slide speaks for itself. I, I can't say enough of how much I've enjoyed working on this project. It's um, Crystal and Katie Anderson and Lisa Tattersall at WCCLS have really been super supportive on getting this project launched and ready to go. Uh, my colleague here, Carol Reich, has been very instrumental. I guess now, if there's any questions from the board, I would I would love to answer anything you have or you're thinking about. Thank you, Linda and our library partners. Um, yes, feel free to ask any questions or let me know if you have any board members. One question that I had, Linda, was in the HPL to go, are students able to participate in that now with this student card? Uh, with the YALA, you mean? Yes. 
Yeah, the yellow is a, um, and maybe Crystal can jump in and help me with this one, but um, the yellow is a data transfer file. And we're, what the plan is, is uh, beginning in October, uh, we're going to go ahead and take the registrations that we have for HSD. So um, it's been a while, but let's just say approximately 21,000 students. It's been a while. I don't know, Travis, maybe you can tell me how many students you have now. 20, 20,000. Okay, well, I gave you a, a, an extra thousand. Okay, so 20,000 and we do a transfer file. So basically uh, we're going ahead and transferring the just basic essentials to, to those fields, your name, your address, the school, your grade, and your contact information, such as an email. Um, and then we're going to transfer it over. Crystal, do you want to fill that side of the technic technology? Well, I mean, it's pretty easy. It's just a data transfer, and then all of those students will have accounts, so they absolutely could use HBL to go at that time. And we're estimating, if all goes well, that that would start in November. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Jackie and then Lisa. Um, I just had a question about if using their student ID is this, this YALA program, does that limit the titles they are able to check out? I know it, it said in there about access online and age appropriate um, books. I just want to understand, I think, a little bit more what that restriction, if there is any, what it is. I can answer that one. Um, so using Sora, um, another reason we really like Sora is because it is for schools. And so it does actually filter the content. Um, so when students go into Sora and then add their YALA and then access uh, HPL through their YALA, they're only going to see juvenile and teen titles. Now, um, a way to get around that, let's say if you have like an 11th or 12th grader who wants to read adult titles, is just to simply download the Libby app and access YALA through Libby, because Libby is all access for everybody. Thank you. Lisa and then Yadira. Hello. Uh, I don't have questions. I just have comments. Uh, my comments are, uh, this is so exciting. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this with us. I know that we have been talking about this for a really long time. Um, I can remember conversations about making this happen way back when, and I am so just over the moon excited that it's finally happening and it's so close. November is so soon. Um, I think this is going to be such a great opportunity for our students to be exposed to the library and the awesome resources that are available there. And uh, I could not be more enthusiastic and way excited. So thank you very much. Yadira and then thank Martin. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just have a question. So what if a student changes districts? Like, let's say a Hillsborough student moves into Beaverton. Um, since this is like a countywide right initiative, does um, the, that number change at all, their access number? I can answer if you'd like, Linda. Yeah, that'd be great. So um, the card is good until January of 20. 22 um, and then it will expire if the student isn't still at Hillsborough School District. However, they are still in our system and so if they try to use our resources, they will be prompted to update their information and they can keep an account that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Martin? Yeah, I just wanted to say, Linda and Vanessa and Crystal, thank you so much for for reaching out to us and engaging with us um, at the board level. I've always felt that, uh, you know, it's really all about the community. And I've always felt that what defines a community is its schools, its parks, and its libraries. And uh, to see uh, WCCLS and more specifically the city of Hillsborough partnering with us you know, in a way to better our community is truly, it's just amazing, especially on the fundamental skill of reading. Um, full disclosure, I'm a, I'm a Washington County employee. I'm a colleague with Crystal. And uh, in my library is the Little Community Library. I'm a member there. So I'm a big fan of libraries and uh, I love taking my granddaughter to the library. So thank you very much. Ooh, thank you. Thank you. I also just want to say thank you for this great presentation. I think it's 
also speaks um, to some of the topics that we've had in, in our previous board meetings around partnerships with the city. And I'm really appreciative of how you took our strategic plan, what our needs are for our students with early learning, uh, with you know pre-K, the things that you knew about us and what we were needing and you tailor this program to help us get our students engaged in that way. So I'm really appreciative of that work that you did and how in alignment it is with our own needs and strategic planning. So thank you so much. Thank you. And again, uh, I think you captured it, Erica. I think this is another way of underscoring or underlining the, uh, the commitment the city has for the school district. It's a phenomenal school district. I'm glad we're a part of it. I'm glad I have the opportunity to work on other projects with the school district. And it's, I'm just so excited about this project. <laughs> I've worked a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Have a good evening. You too. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye. Our next item on our agenda tonight is our facilities naming process with Mike. All right, thank you. And and thanks to our library friends. That has been a long haul and uh, really, really glad that we've arrived there. So thank you. Um, as you know, we've been working on the on this naming process for the new elementary school in North Plains for uh, several months now. Uh, we had a naming task force that has uh, brought forward uh, four names for your consideration. I'm passing those names on this evening. And uh, you can see those on page six of your packet. Um, Otfolity Ridge, Ridge View, Sunset Ridge, and Sunset View are the four names that are being submitted. Um, when I, as we were planning for the, as we were doing the agenda planning for this meeting, I mean, talking with uh, Lisa and Martin, um, our recommendation for the work session portion of this topic is that we would uh, narrow this down to one or two names that would be that would be brought forward for a final decision in the regular session this evening. So um, we, we talked a little bit about how we might go about doing that. And um, before I turn this back over to Erica to facilitate the discussion in the process, um, I was just going to suggest that um, potentially uh, following the discussion, we would have each board member give both their first and their second choice. And we could, uh, we could assign two points for each first choice vote, one point for each second place vote, and then we could just tally up and see um, see what happens in terms of the uh, of the two most popular. Um, we could at least do that as a starting point, and then uh, talk about the results after that. Uh, prior prior to that process, though, uh, we do want to um, have a discussion around this and make sure everyone has their questions answered. Um, you'll also notice on pages uh, seven through ten of your packet, uh, we've provided some background information and Casey can speak to the surveying that occurred as well as the discussions that occurred in the naming task force. So with that, I will turn it over to Erica. So board members, if you want to just, um, you know, put, put a little mark or something on the chat, if you have a comment or some feedback you would like to provide or any additional discussion that you would like to do before we enter into um, just getting everyone's first and second pick. Or feel free to jump in. <laughs> Jackie, go ahead. Sorry, I was having dinner. <laughs> um, I um, I would like more information. I I. I think that um, I have found some information on the, the tribe that we're looking at naming after um, that is worrisome to me. And it, I just want to make sure that we do our due diligence, that we make an informed decision and not make a decision that could potentially embarrass the school district. Um, and I know that it was common for Native Americans to be slave owners, but I just want to make sure that our board members all understand um, what this information is and it was it's from the Oregon Encyclopedia which is the Oregon Historical Society that it says that the tribe were slave owners um, larger villages had only one or more chiefs who with their immediate families were distinguished by the quality of their apparel and the value of their property and that property included slaves um, and slave status was hereditary 
it wasn't, I know a lot of Native American tribes um, had slaves via conquest. And between um, after, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but um, that so their slave status was hereditary. Um, and in fact, the slaves were not permitted to um, to subject their infants to the frontal occipital flattening, which is was very common with this tribe, um, because that's the mark was the mark of a free birth among um, lower Columbia native people. So I just I think we need to make sure that we know what we're voting for and who we're voting for. Um, I, I'd like to hear what our other board members um, think about this. I from the beginning have said I'm not a fan of um, naming anything after a person or a people. Not that they don't deserve it. Um, I just have difficulty um, doing that. Anytime you name anything after a certain group, you, you leave out and alienate other groups and other people. And I just wanna make sure that we are being um, reflective of that. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I have a question from Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to confirm there's really, there's nothing new in the board packet from what we discussed last time. Okay, thank you. Yep. That's correct, nothing new. So um, if anybody has any additional comments or questions regarding that, I think that that's a, it is an interesting point to bring up um, in regards to this context. I think a lot of um, the study of just um, slavery and racism and how it differs from cultural practices or people that have done certain things, um, whether it be like tribes or um, communities, or there's a lot of uh, information that comes um, this is like such a big topic to unpack and a lot of times um, using that example of um, there was slavery before and how is it different than the slavery that we talk about when we're talking about racial justice and I think it's really kind of one of those really important things to touch on because it's not something that we are educated on uh, even early on and understanding that the concept of creating, you know, the racial construct and to enslave a particular group of people based on the color of the skin is different than a cultural practice that was done um, a long, long time ago, where, where we tried to escape from that. And then in order to maintain that power structure, a racial construct created that said a particular group of people because of the color of the skin are only three, three fourths of a human being which is a different, it, not to be conflated with what we're talking about that tribes did before as a part of the customer culture and um, how slavery kind of took place in that time in history versus what we're talking about when we're talking about racial justice. So I just wanna make sure that we are understanding that there are two different um, paradigms, I would say, that, that could, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. And there's a lot of history and uh, education, I think, that needs to be done to unpack that a little bit better. Um, and then I see on here, Martin has a comment as well. And then I'll let uh, Jackie also comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm, I'm unafraid of um, the name that we're, we're discussing. And I, I um, have great respect for Jackie's concerns. It's my assessment that we can we can do this right though. And I think the thoughtful uh, name that we've come up with actually thoughtfully invites the kind of discovery that, that, that Jackie has shared with us. Like, wow, there's a whole lot more to this than I ever understood. And uh, so I think that the name of the school, if it invites exactly the kind of thoughtful discussion we're having about cultural practices and really difficult issues like slavery, I think, I think we've nailed it if we do it right and we do it thoughtfully and we do it in a way that respects um, the native, the native peoples of this area. That's, that's really what, 
um, I'm passionate about. Um, and, I, and I would also add to, to Jackie's point that there are other names in our midst that also have a similar background that don't aren't flashpoints for for a lot of um, angst. And, and I would just say Tualatin, for example, they're really... Um, Martin, uh, Jackie, and then Lisa. Um, I do understand the two point, the two views on this that you brought up, Eric, I really do. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm not afraid to take a stand and be bold. Um, in my opinion, slavery is slavery, no matter the cultural practice. And we should be very careful in how we honor that. Um, that's all I'm saying is there are other names that are brought forward here um, that are not a person or a group of people that would still honor the location, um, but not honor the practice of slavery. Lisa? Thank you. Uh, so first, I apologize for missing um, the last discussion that um, we had about this at our uh, September 8th meeting. So sorry that I couldn't be with you there. Um, I have to say, I this this is not this was not new information to me um, as someone who's kind of dug into the history of our area. Um, and I definitely agree with what Erica said about there being a difference between race-based slavery and a cultural practice um, that predates. I, I do agree with that. However, um, I will say that um, Jackie's words when she was sharing the concern um, changed my perspective a little bit. Uh, I find myself being a bit swayed um, to agree. Um, I, I think that it is important to honor the first peoples who were in this area since they, they, they don't have um, the, I mean, this is not uh, the land of, of those people anymore, right? And so I think it's important history and that pride in, in who was here first and who came before. So I definitely support that idea and I would be on board with finding a way to do that. However, I also think that we've all seen um, in the last um, year or two how perceptions change over time and the way that people view things even you know, three years ago to now changes. And I would hate for us to, to be put in the position where we're forced to reevaluate a name that we gave to a facility um, in, a, in a short time. So I, I understand wanting to be cautious there. Um, so I'm not necessarily married to any name on this list. And if we think that there's a another way to do it, however, to, to Martin's point, the Tualatin tribe that you're talking about, they're, they're actually, it's the same same group of first people. It's the same umbrella. There's not. It's not. A, they're not different. And so I don't know if there there is a different way to go. Um, so I'm I'm not a I'm I I find myself sort of being interested in. Do we have to decide this today? Can we? I mean, we've had, we went through all this process. So I also understand we don't want to redo that. I get that. And if we do, then we'll, I'll, I'll go for a different name, I guess. But I I want to. Now I'm in a feedback loop. I'm almost done. I want to honor. Um, the first people, and I'm on board with doing that. But I also definitely hear Jackie's argument, and I and I understand that concern, and I um, I, I share it in in at least partiality. So, thank you, Lisa, uh, Mark, and then Martin. There was some discussion at the last board meeting of someone representing the tribe uh, speaking with us tonight, or reading an email into. The record is that likely to happen or is that not something that was able to be put together no i can read the email uh, again i thought that that was if it got to the point of the next phase of this into the regular session for the public to hear but i have we have the email yeah it's more i uh to me it seems um less about if if that's the name that's chosen it's more of a factor of would it be the name chosen if we know that it has their complete uh, endorsement? Okay, right, you want me to read the email now, Mark? I just would like to have, uh, what I would like is to have somebody from the tribe tell us that, yeah, we're on board with this and it's a great idea. Um, absent of that, I would accept, I guess, reading the email. Okay, yeah, this is uh, an email who we've been working with with the, the tribe and, um, his name is David, and he's the cultural resources manager for the Grand Ronde tribes. And his 
last email to us uh, says, hello, the name Atfalati Ridge is an agreeable name and I see no concerns with it. Um, I do not believe there is a need for formal support from the tribe of this name. If formal support of the tribe is needed, it would take a couple months once we declare it was needed. I would be the person to work with uh, at the tribe for an opening ceremony if that time comes. Um, and then there's another email that has um, some considerations about uh, the school mascot. And they also cited uh, the Salem Kaiser School District who named uh, one of their elementary schools uh, after the Kalapua tribe, which is uh, uh, you know under this umbrella of the Tualatin Valley. Um, that they went through this process several years ago um, and their elementary mascot was the condors, which was culturally significant and mean meaningful species as their mascot. Do we know if when Salem Kaiser made that naming choice that the, somebody from the tribe spoke an endorsement? I mean, it, it sounds, that sounds less than an endorsement and that if we want an endorsement, we can approach them. Sounds like, yeah, be yeah, all right, probably. I don't know the history of the Salem Kaiser process. Okay. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Martin with a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I I think we have to recognize that, um, and I mentioned this last time, that that we are in a district that has celebrated white men by name. And if you just kind of look at the district. It's a celebration of white men. And, and I very specifically want to counter that by celebrating people and persons who are not white men. And I think that this is a time, this is a being an anti-racist institution. You know, I, I think to not be racist was to like pick a very neutral name like Northwest or Galaxy. But to be anti-racist is to be more, let's celebrate, let's overtly celebrate people of color. And, and um, I, I guess on some level, Jackie and I are bookends in that uh, regard, and that's okay. Uh, but I, I really truly want to go there. I want to celebrate people and persons of color as we consider names for HSD schools. I think it's entirely appropriate given the setting where we've celebrated so many of our white ancestors. Um, in that uh, podcast I shared uh, with my colleagues, actually Rose did, um, step one of how to be an anti-racist was accept that we've all been raised in a country that elevates white culture. And I think HSD manifests that in our naming. And I would very specifically like to not do that going forward to just exclusively celebrate white culture. And, and to me, this is a very thoughtful and an appropriate way to do that. I could be wrong, but I'm just sharing with my colleagues uh, my read on it. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And I think to the point of, I think, understanding that individuals, communities, whole systems are complex. I think the acknowledgement that our our country was founded on this on slavery and everything since then is tainted by it. Every name, every system, every process. And so to say that now fighting back to kind of um, combat that erasure of peoples that were here, um, I think that is what is a little concerning to me in regards to maybe some of the apprehension is we understand there's a lot of complexity that there's no such thing as a perfect society or people or group or individuals, but understanding what it is as a district, what our goal is, like Martin said, in being anti-racist and fighting against the erasure of people that were here um, and honoring that. It's not honoring a particular practice that once happened, you know, that we're highlighting right now. It's honoring a culture and the people that were here and that because of colonization are no longer here and we they just completely go away their language and then I think 
that's something that is very um, scary to me to think that we would do that, um, that we have an opportunity to capture a moment in time to say that at this moment we had some reflection in our community um, and intentionality of keeping some of that history. And so I just want to also offer that as um, something for us to think about. And I think that as a board, we need to be in alignment of what it means to be anti-racist and how we do this work because we are supporting our whole community in this work. So I also wanna, I understand the amount of work, engagement and outreach that our staff did through this whole process and naming it and um, making sure that we got feedback from our own community, seeing the results on that spreadsheet of what they themselves would like to see reflected and that we also honor that. Um, but I also wanna make sure that at the board, we speak with that one voice and that we're able to be united in the work that we're doing in our district. So I'm also open to hearing if there's suggestions for us of how to do uh, extend this process or add some other component to it that might uh, make our board arrive to that place. Um, Mark, you had a question? Yeah, it's really just a Jackie. So like um, if just to dive into your concern a little bit more, would, would you say that your concern is more with the particular history of this tribe or more to illustrate the idea that we shouldn't name after people or, or a person? Um, I've never been a fan of, and I, and you all know this from the beginning, I don't right. believe we should be naming it after a person or a people. Um, and I do know that, you know, part of the culture that we're talking about honoring includes slavery. And I realize that slavery is ingrained in our history and there's not going to be a person or people that we decide to honor that doesn't have some sort of negative connotation or um, experience. And I understand that. And that's one of the reasons that I so adamantly am not in support of naming a school after a people or a person. So to your question, Mark, I'm not a fan of it. I don't think it, I don't think it matters who it is that we name we bring forward, if it's a tribe or if it's a person or a group of people, I, I probably, I would be hard pressed to support that. Right. So if it, if it were any, so my, just trying to understand, trying to just understand all the variables as much as possible. So if it were a, another person, we would be discussing possibly their history or a different tribe. We would be discussing possibly their history in service to the idea that we shouldn't be naming things after a person or peoples, or is it really just a concern that the Atfalati tribe participated in slavery? No, it's, it's the former, no person, no people. I just, I think that that's, Thanks. I think there Thanks are other sure. ways to honor. Thank you. Before I share some thoughts, I'm I'm wondering if um, any of our student reps would like to weigh in. We haven't heard from them during the work session. Go ahead, Maya. Um, I just had a little comment. I just wanted to say that I agree with um, Erica that there is not um, a group a perfect community or a perfect group of people. But I feel, in my opinion, the biggest injustice here was um, stolen land and a lost language and a lost culture. And I feel that um, that we can maybe be anti-racist in that sense. And um, just, yeah, that's kind of just my thoughts on it. Thank you, Maya. Yadira, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm not sure if any other student rep wants to comment. I don't want to take any time, but I would, um, I appreciate your, your comments, um, Erica. Um, I would, I would agree with them. And um, I don't think that we'll um, arrive to a place that 
that is going to satisfy everyone unless we take this um, really safe stance, which would be like naming it after the sunset or something like that. And um, I would agree that in order to 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 be anti-racist, we do have to go in that direction. And sometimes it's not always the safest um, way to go, right? We're not going to um, please everyone, but um, this is this is also a way that um, our students see us honoring people of different um, backgrounds. So um, yeah, I would I, I would just say that that you know not taking it into consideration and only um, especially like you know um, naming buildings after different peoples or um, all of that excludes a lot of people of color. So I'm just um, comfortable um, with the selection that we have and um, and yeah, so. Thank you, Adira. Um, Iram, did you have a comment? Um, kind of what Maya was saying as well, I feel like it's a good way to be anti-racist um in any case of naming a school or just naming anything of by a person or people it will bring up controversy but i feel like the board is very prepared to you know kind of back up why if we were to go with that name why that specific name was chum and i think it's a very good way to kind of shed some light on people of color Okay, so I'm keeping us in just in time. If there are, um, if there is no further comments or discussion on this topic, I think I just want to hear from our board members if you are all uh, just ready to kind of give us your number one and number two pick, and we can go from there and see how we tally up. If you, um, I'm looking at messages pictures on here, so I might not capture everyone. But if you are, I think it would be great if you can put it in the chat for us. That way Mike can tally up. So to be clear, Erica, you want us to put in the chat our first and second choices? Yeah, so just put number one, the name, number two, the name on Erica, we could could somebody enter in the chat the the four names that we're choosing from so we I can get the spelling correct? <laughs> sure. I'm, I'm not so sure the variations of sunset. Thank you, Rose. And also, I mean, you have the four options there that um, Rose put on the screen for you, but if none of those meet, you can also just not vote for any of them if you don't like any of the options as well. Is it everyone but you, Madam Chair? Oh, sorry, I'm putting on there. 
Okay, let's see. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. And, oh, Lisa, I wasn't missing up here. Didn't scroll further enough. Okay, I think you have all the tally there, Mike. Okay, I do. Okay, here we go. So um, in first place, um, Atfalati Ridge with 11 points. In second place is Sunset Ridge with five points. And in third place is Ridgeview with two. I just want to say I'm really appreciative of our board and being, first of all, vulnerable and having these discussions. And it takes really a lot of um, trust in our relationship and our work together to be able to reflect on something that every institution is grappling with right now. This is not just us that we're dealing with these policies and processes and really um, having more um, time to really look at uh, what it is that we decide on and how we do them. I think it's it's really important to kind of say, uh, to highlight how in the past names, whether they be by people or person, were probably not never as discussed or thought of to the degree as now we're having these really um, great conversations around this. So I appreciate everybody's input and really just the discussion around this and our student reps and being able to be here and participate with us on something like this. It's really incredible that our board is even here at this point to be able to have these conversations. So I just want to say kudos to all of you for bringing yourself and being present and engaging in this. I think, Mark, did you have, did you say we discuss Atfalati Ridge and Sunset Ridge downstairs? Oh, so what is the process now, Mike, for us is if we kind of have something highlight, I think maybe we want to discuss with our uh, board members here, if we kind of want to come to a decision of somebody making a motion or how do we do that? Yeah, what, uh, the process that we discussed was uh, make a decision whether we want to take one or two names forward uh, into the regular session and then uh, maybe have an idea of who would make that motion um, once we get down there. So I'm looking for our board members to give me any uh, comments or feedback if you would like to take one name or both names seeing how we had our, our point separation, 11, five and two. Mark, go ahead. Uh, my choice would be to bring both for discussion in the more general session. Two people I think chose Sunset Ridge as their first choice. So right. I don't think it'd be fair to discard that. Um, so I feel like discussing both in the full session uh, would probably be my first choice. And I see a comment by Lisa that the points made the top choice pretty clear and we've discussed it already. M Martin? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned that the, um, the board session discussion will not really be informative. Uh, and, and I would just almost recommend that everybody who really wants to hear how this board wrestled with it and came to a conclusion. They really, they really need to hear this discussion and the uh, previous work session discussion too. I, I don't want to misrepresent the good work this board did by just a uh, sort of glossing over the decision-making process in the next one. I'm, I'm for just to clean, bring it in and, and vote on it um, and refer back to this work session discussions if that was, if that's possible. Uh, Jackie, go ahead. Sorry, having technical issues as usual. Um, I think that, I mean, I know that uh, the points made in the top choice is pretty clear. Um, I do think that we owe it to those who come to the live, to the, to the um, general meeting to at least have a little bit of a discussion about maybe why we chose this and or why we didn't choose this. But um, I really could go either way on it. But I do think it's important that we don't just say, oh, go back, 
the last two work sessions to figure out how we came to this decision. I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Mark. Yeah, I guess I, I might be a little beholden to pre COVID ways. I guess I sort of still, there's really no differentiation between the regular session and the work session at this point, they're all just taking place in the exact same context and anybody wants to follow them can follow them on YouTube or not. But I, I guess I still sort of, uh, believe that they're different in some way. And if, but if that's just not the case, I'm fine. So I think what we're um, hearing from multiple people is we kind of know what the top pick is. We want to just make our vote and bring that one um, top choice. But we do want to um, say a little summary of maybe just the discussion and um, the uh, work that we did right now to come to that uh, to that choice. And also, I think as Mark and Martin alluded in our regular board sessions, usually we don't have that much of an audience during work sessions that maybe we do now because it's online. But normally we would have these discussions the same way and then we go downstairs and just vote. So sometimes our audience wouldn't also be privy to what we discuss if they weren't present. But I think in how we're doing it right now in COVID, I think it makes sense to have maybe just a little synopsis of what we discuss. And then also to say, if you wanna see like our full discussion, it's of course available on our website and you can see that not just for today, but also from the past. And um, one way that we could do that, I think Jackie just put on here, maybe each board member can say why they chose the name that they chose in a short statement. If that sounds okay with everybody. Eric, if I could, if I could make a suggestion here, I think one of the things that we want to make sure of is when we open a new school, we want to be, we want to be celebrating that, right? We want to make sure that this is a celebration of opening a new school, of um, spending bond dollars wisely. Um, it'll, it, it'll be a huge investment in the North Plains community, and we want to make sure that we, that we keep this a celebration. So I think, I think as we discuss this and as we talk about it in the regular session. We want to make sure that we honor the process that we went through and 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 not just the process of the naming task force or the work that Casey did, but really the discussion that took place here. I don't think we can view this as a a loss or a um, or somehow a negative experience. I think this experience has been a positive one. And when we and when we talk things out the way we did and we have this um, very bold and blunt conversation among board members. That that's a win for the community, and it's a very it's a very thoughtful process. I know that our Native American um, PAC is meeting on September 30th, and uh, they can definitely weigh in on this. And I know that Olga has had some conversation around that already, and um, and I think we can still pursue a formal endorsement um, through Casey's contacts. Um, and so I, I just would want us to understand that this this was not a negative process. This was a, a great conversation that needed to take place. And and I think it's a telling as to where we are um, as a nation and as a community. And I, I just applaud the board members for weighing into this. Um, so much appreciated. And Olga, I don't um, I know we're already behind time. I don't know if you want to offer a comment here in your conversations uh, with Daria, but uh, this this might be just a few minutes to do that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes, uh, Daria um, has uh, coordinated a parent meeting uh, with the Native American PAC for the 30th at 6.30. And uh, from my uh, conversations with her, it sounds that she's very much in favor of uh, and loves the idea of connecting with parents uh, one more time, especially because they, many of them did not have a, a chance during the summer to provide feedback. And so an organized meeting would um, provide that space for them to be able to hear more about how the names came about and, and give some, uh, provide some feedback. Um, so that was the intent uh, of that meeting. And um, so the plan was to also invite uh, Casey and Jane um, to come and uh, per perhaps uh, answer some questions that they may have. Thank you. Um, Mark, did you have a, a question? And then we'll recap the process again. 
for everyone. Of what right. we're doing. I, I guess that's where that's what my question was the process. So look, looking forward to the motion. The motion is we haven't decided what the name of the school is. We will put it on 30 day review. And my question, I guess, is what does that entail? Are we it does a review actually take place or is it just perfunctory and in 30 days that just becomes the name? Um, I think, you know, back to this uh, notion of we want to make sure this is a celebration of a, of a new building for us. I think we can, during that 30 day period, we can have that conversation with the PAC. Uh, we can also um, consult the uh, elders in the community and get their feelings on this. And we can have additional information and making sure this is a win for everybody as we make, as we um, move towards the end of those 30 days. So, it, so based on Casey's email or the, what Casey shared with us from the email, it's unlikely to endorse this name publicly with us with only 30 days to, to do that. It takes a couple of months, a couple of months. Um, so we're not naming the school tonight, we're putting on 30 day review and like any other policy, we have to adopt it in 30 days. I still would feel more comfortable adopting this as the official name if we had some public uh, declaration from the tribe that they're okay with it. Mark, let us let us work to make that happen. I think uh, I think we can have our um, Native American Parent Advisory Committee also weigh in, and um, let us work to see if we can get someone from the tribe to join us. So, um, Shean had a question, and then we'll recap our process. Yeah, I think it was more of a clarification question based on what Olga had shared um, at the September thirtieth meeting when American Catholics together, would they potentially have the opportunity to bring forth another name considering a lot of the parents didn't have, weren't available during the summer to give input and feedback? Um, or what is the input, in, or would the input and feedback be about the name that we are voting or motioning to put forward tonight? Uh, that is a board decision. So um, if if we received information that um, somehow compelled us to extend this process or to consider another name, we could definitely do that. We do have a little bit of, and this, I don't want to speed through this, but we do have um, an obligation to our contractor here um, at the first of, around the first of November to be bringing forward a name because uh, some of the construction work obviously builds that into the into the school itself and the selection of colors mascot that kind of thing that that is part of the construction process so um but we can that that would be a board decision and so if i guess if we hear anything back or will you be sending that in an update or something for us to, you know if anything came up that was worth the board knowing from that group meeting on the 30th. Could you share that with us? Um, we can plan on, Rose, would you remind me the date of our next work session? What, what I'm, do you have it, Casey? No, I was gonna say, I would imagine after the Tuesday's meeting that we would put a, just a summary in the board update of that week so that we could capture the how the discussion went like we would you know, really in any other type of a pack or any topic of discussion. Okay. So we, have, we have a work session on October 13th and a regular session on October 27th. Okay. Why don't we plan on giving you an update on October 13th? By that time, um, uh, oldest team will have had the Native American PAC meeting that will have taken place. And we can also reach out to the tribe and uh, get see if we can get a more a formal endorsement to um, to make sure that everyone's mind at ease on the everyone's mind at ease, and we can um, have a have a thorough process that everyone feels good about. Um, so I'm I'm watching our time, and I will follow up with your question mark for Mike on the asking just if you can let us know if there's a way of us attending and like just a virtual audience or something like that. I kind of want to just um, solidify our process going downstairs because I know there's an idea of us. Um, the process is somebody makes a motion for the name, then there's a second, and then we have the discussion. And I think in that discussion portion is where individuals can um, state you know, why they are 
uh, voting for this or not voting for this or abstaining from them. I think that gives you that space to say or mention any a statement that you would like that kind of captures the discussion that you brought to our work session so that we're sharing that with our audience. Does everybody seem like that's a good way of doing that? Looking at, okay, I see head nodding. Okay, um, and then does anybody want to make a motion or is it, we're just gonna see who does it? <laughs> Just wondering if we wanted to organize ourselves now. Is there is there a script for the motion? Is there something that is out there? Okay. Right. Yeah, uh, it's in the pack. I would be glad to do that. Uh, if I'm clear, uh, are, we, are we nominating two, three, one name? We decided that just the one that got okay. the majority of votes, I think that everybody was fine with that's just the number and okay. then during our discussion time people can also mention any of the other ones that they might have liked or or liked and, but why they're voting for this one or not voting okay I'm, I'm certainly willing to do that if anybody else wants to raise their hand and do that that would that would be probably preferable all right i think that gets us going at least and then whoever can jump in in a second that'd be great just want to make sure we got our process done um, so with that, moving on just for our the interest of time, we have our goal, uh, bo board goal discussion with Mike. All right, thank you. You'll remember that uh, we have been talking about the uh, board goals. Uh, at, we talked about that at the last meeting and uh, Rose and I were charged with drafting those goals and bringing them back to you as for your consideration. So these goals would be in addition to supporting the, uh, the goals that are set forth on the strategic plan for the 2021 school year. So um, in your packet on page 11, you'll see that uh, the draft goals, they're the first one. I'm just going to read this for um, any, any listeners out there. Uh, the first uh, goal on the draft is the board will be visible as community leaders through actively participating in district community virtual events. Visible and engagement opportunities, including remote attendance at virtual listening sessions, uh, virtual school activities events, and district organized virtual events. When safe to do so, board members will participate in in-person engagement opportunities. So that was the first goal. The second goal, the board will adopt legislative priorities for the next biennium and actively participate in advocacy on behalf of the district in regards to stable and adequate funding. And then the third one, the board will work toward becoming an anti-racist community through participation in professional development, policy review, and systemic analysis. So those are, those are the goals that have been drafted for your consideration. Martin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't have a key in the um, third goal. Um, I'd prefer to be more specific and use the term uh, institution. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm more qualified to speak on behalf of the institution than the community, given the, my, my seat on the board. So that would be my preference. Uh, Jackie? I think, Eric, you made a good point about the definition of anti-racist. And I don't know if we want to just table that and, and make that separate discussion so that because these are our board goals, so that we as a board understand what what we mean when we say anti-racist and whether it's institution or community. Um, I just think that that might be an important distinction, not necessarily written down in here, but so that we understand it. I think that that's something that we can do a, a district wide is make sure that we all have the same vocabulary when we say that, that our students, our teachers, our staff, they all know that's what we mean when we say it as a board. So that might be something a little bit more overarching, Mike, that we can do as a district. Yes, and we, we do have a definition that we've been using and we will, I know this isn't the time for it, but we can, uh, we can uh, definitely share that. Thank you. Any other comments or feedback between the institution versus community? I can definitely see the argument for both. I know that 
where we sit and doing policy review as we're defining it is only within this organization. Um, and systemic analysis is also within what we have power to do so, which is in this institution. So I can definitely see that. Um, Lisa, did you have a comment? Um, yay! So uh, I'm going to get one. Selves could be an institution. So I'm not sure if the wording uh, makes that much of a difference, but I, I agree with what Martin's trying to get at. And and so I would support that change if that's where, the way we went. But I think that the reason. Other than that, if um, nobody has any additional feedback or really want to drastically change any of our goals, speak now uh, or else I'm moving to our next item in the interest of time. Right. Thank you. Um, our next item is just our fall update with Travis Ryman. Thank you. It has my name on the agenda, but it is a team approach. So um, I'll pass to Dale and Jordan to give quick updates on uh, connecting with families and technology. Good evening. Hi, thank you uh, so much for the soft start week. I wanted to share some successes um, in terms of the way that time is used. Of course, teachers use it for planning and PLCs and collaborative work, which I think was amazing because it really helped uh, ease us into our first full week. But um, the news that we were all excited about was just the connections made um, with families. So as of yesterday, and principals were still trying to slide in numbers today, but we're keeping with yesterday's numbers. As of yesterday, we we're at 95% connections and contacts with our families in elementary schools. And we had um, four, five schools, I just want to yell them out because they were able to get um, either 100 or 99% um, as of Monday, which were Arenco, Lenox, Indian Hills, Farmington View, and McKinney. So um, I know everybody has that goal and they're continuing to work on it, but 95% is great. Our middle schools are almost at 90%. And again, our goal is 100, so we're gonna continue to do that work. And as of last week, high school was just over um, about th three fourths of our students contacted. Um, the plan really is uh, to continue to work with um, our family outreach liaisons, our graduation coaches, our counselors is kind of a next layer if we weren't able to connect that last quarter of our students, but we know we've seen some of them this week get uh, accurate phone numbers and contacts for families. So I think overall, everybody was very pleased. Um, I directly support high school and I heard a lot of amazing things from high school. People just saying we never have that time to get those kind of deep connections with a group of kids. Um, and just really appreciated the opportunity to listen to families, proactively connect with families, and to serve their needs. We had about uh, a little over 800 families request assistance of some sort. Um, about 45% of the, those requests were um, community-based, whether that's food or clothing or rent assistance, um, and we'll work with our team to make sure that we get those needs served as well as um, additional like homework support, um, some mental health needs were shared. So just about under 5% of the families we contacted requested uh, another layer of support. So we're currently working on making sure that we close the loop and, and get all those needs served as well. So uh, just a really great uh, opportunity for us and we're very thankful for your support of that. For tech, we've uh, been very busy over the last few weeks, but in standing up a new uh, student family support line, uh, we had over um, 1,800 calls go in and out of that uh, last week. Um, and probably a third of that was on Monday, um, on the 14th, that first day. Um, and so, but we were able to service families through there. There was a wait on Monday, but since Monday, there has not really been a wait. It's mostly been uh, uh, either a very small uh, wait time or none at all uh, during the school day. So we're open 7.30 to four o'clock on that support line. And then from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday, we're doing callbacks to families. And so we've been taking care of all of those nighttime requests, um, usually within minutes of them after they leave a voicemail, we call them back. So um, we have been able to fulfill that need and will continue to do so. Um, we have over 13,000 Chromebooks that have been given out to families um, and are being used every day. Uh, 
sometimes going over between three and four million websites a day um, that are going through those. And we had almost a thousand new Chromebooks arrive at Hill High uh, late last week and have been giving those out to us this week, um, in fact, today. Um, and so we, with retrieving those devices back from other students and getting those uh, prepped and sanitized and checked, we'll be able to fulfill all of the requests for devices by the end of this week to all families. So um, uh, feel good about that. Um, lots of work's gone into that by the schools, getting those out to families. So, um, so yeah, we've been busy. So thank you. Thanks, Jordan and Dale. Um, I'm not sure who's driving the slideshow. Can you advance two slides, please? My part of the update tonight is really um, supporting the board and tracking the metrics that would allow us to make um, decisions about who comes into school to learn. Um, as you know, the governor set metrics, and this is from uh, Willamette SD's website. You can search it by county. And if you're interested in looking at the site yourselves, there's a link at the bottom right-hand corner. Um, I checked today and it still hasn't updated for last week, but you can see in three consecutive weeks, what we would need to achieve is fewer than 30 per 100,000 and a po test positivity rate of lower than 5%. Um, consider bringing back students K3. When we get to 10 cases per 100,000, bringing back learners K-12. So you can see that the week of September 6th was the first time that Washington County got below um, 30 cases per 100,000. We're at 26 there. So if we were to have plateau at 26 again, we'd have the second week of a three weeks uh, streak of lower than 30 per 100,000 cases. Um, so what we need to do as a community is begin to talk about um, how it would be to bring students K2 or K3 back into schools in HSD. So go ahead and click forward again. So we've built some tools to start communicating about this and we wanted you to be the first to see them. Um, we have five stages here. The first stage is went, would be a shelter in place. Uh, no one leaves their homes and we're all distance learning. The second phase would be limited in-person opportunities, and that's where we are today. Um, the third stage would be K-2 or K-3. Um, as you know, we're staffed at K-2 to be able to bring students back daily. Um, for third grade, we might do a hybrid um, model. Uh, um, stage four, we would be able to talk about comprehensive distance learning plus in-person instruction K-12. And stage five would be the circumstance where we could fully come back to school. We have a tool that would tell you more details about what each phase means. And that could cover both instruction and athletics. Don't look too close, Lisa. It's not, a, it's not meant for being readable. On, um, but what we wanted to do is flesh out some of the details with our leadership team uh, and bring that document forward so we can start to talk with the community about this. Um, so next steps for us is that on Octo in October, we're going to start the blue Blueprint teams again, all the logistical and instructional folks putting their heads together and making a plan, tracking the data, and whether or not the data allows us to, uh, Casey and his team are going to start working on our facilities to make them ready for in-person learning when the time comes. Happy to answer any questions. That Those are the updates. Thank you, Travis. And I'm looking at our time to make sure how much we have. We have a couple items left. But let's go with Mark and Martin. Uh, I guess mostly for Dale, with the dramatic success that you see with the sort of late start week and the connections we've been able to make, uh, any consideration for making that part of the new normal as we move forward? Or the, I mean, is, is the week of curriculum worth more than those connections we've made? That's a really interesting question, and I don't think we've batted that one around yet. I think we're, it's time to reconnect with families and check in instead of, you know, at high school, we usually get about 30% of our families participating. So I think we might be able to think a little bit out of the box and, and uh, connect with even more families. So I like the idea. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dale. Martin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Travis, uh, early on, 
the uh, our union partners, uh, classified and licensed, were really wanting to see a much lower uh, prevalence of COVID-19 in the community before before they would you know, really wholeheartedly get behind coming back into the classroom. That was a long time ago. I think we've all moved further down the field, but nevertheless, uh, where are, or, or you said we would see it first, so I suppose that the engagement with uh, our our uh, union partners would, would follow, but, uh, and I can't ask you to speculate, but <clears throat> maybe tell us what would be that process where you would engage with them and get their opinion on your five stages. Um, Jill and Melody have both been embedded with our blueprint team and we're along for the journey as we made our plans to go back in the hybrid model. Um, I, don't, I won't speculate about how they're feeling today and how their membership is feeling, but I would defer to Kana to talk maybe if she has any info about early conversations. Although you're right, Martin, um, we wanted to talk about this with our membership team this morning and the board uh, tonight and then go through a process of engaging different folks in the conversation about what this looks like. I would just say briefly that we've had a collaborative uh, relationship through uh, developing our process with the Blueprint team. We've uh, included all of the executive board members from each of the union leaderships, and we would continue that um, just because they've been on the journey and can pivot to that space with hybrid. Thank you, Kana, and thank you, Travis. Thank you all for that update. Um, I'm moving us along to our next item um, in the interest of time. Our next item is our OSBA Board of Directors nomination with myself. So as you all know, um, I currently serve on the OSBA board uh, representing our region. And my seat is not up for election, but there's another seat that is up for election, which is currently held um, by, a, I believe, a Beaverton um, board member, Leor, Leanne Larson. Um, and so I'm just checking, uh, Rose, did, were there any um, last minute or any other nominations or that we know of, or is it right now just to ask if any one of our board members want to entertain nominating? Okay. So if any one of our board members want to be nominated um, to serve on OSBA. I'm happy to provide any information about that board, but uh, Mark. Uh, do if we like the idea of Leanne Larson continuing, do we need to nominate her or do we just vote on her when somebody else nominates her next time? Maybe her board nominates her. Her board needs to nominate her, yeah. Then they would come to us and we would get the list of who's been nominated. But if I don't show any interest from any of our board members that would want to double up and be on there, I think it, it is really nice to have different districts being represented. So it, it, I definitely advocate for that, but I'm also willing to entertain if anybody else would like to do that. And I don't know if Leanne is um, running again, but I'm speculating she is. I have not heard otherwise. And usually the uh, OSBA board members would let us know if they're not planning, planning on running again. Okay, so we will wait till we get a formal nomination and then we'll, we'll be voting on that representation for our region. Our last item on here is legislative priorities with Beth Grazer. Hello, let's see if I can get this done really fast here. All right, can you see the presentation? Somebody say something verbally? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so um, for our 2019 legislative priorities, which was our last full session, similar to what we will be entering in 2021, we had um, five different legislative priorities, three that were connected to financing, and we phrase that as Oregon students deserve stable and adequate education funding, active collaboration to seek new funding mechanisms and efforts to decrease cost drivers to the current education system. We added to that um, a request that any new requirements being put on public education be evidence-based and come with their own funding mechanism, separate from the uh, state school fund. And then our final one was to fully support 
the funding of Measure 98. Last year, for the short session, we added a couple of priorities to that list, and those were to encourage the Legislative Fiscal Office to consult with OASBO, the Oregon Association of School Business Officials, to come up with an accurate current service level figure for the state. I don't know if you recall us talking about that last year, but um, there was a lot of discrepancy between what legislators felt was going to get all school districts to a current service level and um, what some of, especially us larger districts were experiencing. So um, we were wanting some more collaboration between those two bodies. And then dual credit transferability, making sure that dual credits earned by high schoolers could be transferable to any community college or for your college or university in Oregon. As we approach the 2021 session, obviously the legislature will once again be setting the biennial budget for K-12 education. Things we will want to um, pay particular attention to, enrollment factors. Um, we do not yet know how COVID-19 has impacted our enrollment and we won't know that officially until early October. And so how enrollment gets handled is going to um, certainly play a factor in funding collections at the state level for uh, taxes, both property taxes, business taxes. That's a, a big part in how much money is available for the statewide budget. And um, the higher cost of doing business that we have if we are to go back into you know, all students returning to the classroom, what are gonna be our expectations around cleaning and distancing and, and other things that might require us to um, put fewer kids on a bus, for example, do we have to increase our fleet? Do we have to have more staff? Different things like that. Um, we'll want to consult with the OSBA legislative priorities as we look at what our priorities might be. I also know that there's a possibility that Representative Janine Solomon will take up the cause of trying to change the law around uh, the recognition of mobile school-based health centers. So once we find out about that, that, that certainly seems like something we might want to include in our priorities. So just a quick overview of where we're at. Really, I just need to know who might be interested in serving on the advocacy committee. We'll try to squeeze in three meetings. A question for Michelle. Do we need, we've gotten into this model where we uh, are getting a lot of money from, I think, the federal government to sustain activity. Post COVID-19, the nutrition program comes to mind where we're just giving out meal back to a new normal in terms of how we feed our kids. Uh, the meal program has been kind of a moving target for us all along. So we understand across the district, we want to be more intentional about the need for this level of nutrition um, and and then really push the state or maybe even the federal government to as a board priority of ours to say, hey, look, feeding our kids is really critical. And we've established this new normal in COVID and we think we should keep it going. Thank you, Martin, for that feedback. Um, I'm also looking just at our time. And Beth, did you want to get um, some interest gauged who would want to be interested in serving? Or do you want or we have a different opportunity to mention that to you? Um, you can reach out to me directly. And then we can just go ahead and work on scheduling a date. Or you can tell Rose. I know that we've only got three minutes left. So or throw it in the chat, whatever works for you guys. I think the one thing for us to consider is we would want to cap that participation at three board members. I think right now it'd be good to kind of just gauge um, the interest and if we have enough of three. Yeah, I was just thinking three hour lots and it could certainly be um, scheduled around the board members' availability. So. Okay, well, um, you have one comment on there and then board members, if you think about it, please let Beth know and I will. We are ready to enter into our regular session, but 
I will hold off to start like just two minutes to give you some chance to go get some water and get a little break before we start on there. So is it the same link or a different link? I believe it's just the same link. Okay. Yeah, same link. hear me and see me, we are going to be starting our regular session of the Hillsborough School District Board. So I will, if you all just uh, wouldn't mind muting so that we're not all speaking at the same time. Thank you, everyone. Our first item on our agenda is our proclamation with Yadir Martinez. Sorry, I was having trouble with that mute button. <laughs> so, um, and this will be uh, read also bilingual. So I'm gonna do the first verse in Spanish and then first verse in English and so on. So, um, el Distrito Escolar de Hillsborough celebra el mes de la herencia latina para honrar las historias, culturas, de las de los latinoaméricos cuyos ancestros son de España, México, el Caribe, Centro America y Sur America. The Hillsborough School District observes Latinx Heritage Month to honor the histories, cultures, and contributions of Latinx Americans whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. El Escolar de Hillsborough recuerda, re, recuerda que esta se, se, the Hillsborough School District remembers that the observation started in 1968 as Hispanic Heritage Week under President Lyndon Johnson and was enacted into law on August 17, 1988 under President Reagan to cover a 30-day period starting on September 15th and ending on October 15th. El Distrito Escolar de Hillsborough reconoce que las personas de ascendencia latina contribuyeron a nuestra prosperidad y cultura a lo largo de la historia del Distrito Escolar de Hillsborough. The Hillsborough School District recognizes that people of Latinx descent contributed to our prosperity and culture throughout the history of the Hillsborough School District. El Distrito Escolar de Hillsborough honra la ante historia y las diversas culturas de la comunidad latina de Oregon como un parte central de la historia de nuestro estado y es compartida en todas las áreas de Oregon. The Hillsborough School District honors the vibrant shared across all Oregon communities. El Distrito Escolar de Hillsborough celebra el tema de este año of Hillsborough's Latinx community en cual nos motiva a reflexionar sobre el llegado de los personajes latinos que han influido en la historia de nuestra nación y que sirven hoy como líderes en todos los aspectos de nuestra vida nacional, desde el Tribunal Supremo y el Congreso hasta las reuniones de las mesas directivas en todos los Estados Unidos. The Hillsborough School District celebrates this year's theme, Be Proud of Your Past, Embrace the Future, which encourages us to reflect 
on the legacy of Latinx people who have influenced our nation's history and serve today as leaders in all aspects of our natural life from the Supreme Court in Congress to boardrooms across the United States. La, mis la Mesa Directiva del Distrito Escolar de Hillsborough proclama por la presente el mes de 15 de septiembre de 2020 al 15 de octubre de 2020 como the Board of Directors of the Hillsborough School District do hereby proclaim the month of September 15, 2020 to October 15, 2020 be Mes de la Herencia Latina, Latin X Heritage Month. Exhortamos a todos los miembros de la comunidad a unirse a nosotros para reconocer los múltiples contribuciones y logros de los Latinoamericanos Latinoamericanos a la prosperidad de nuestra comunidad. We urge all community members to join us in recognizing the many contributions and achievements of Latinx Americans to the development and prosperity of our community. Thanks. Thank you, Yadira. Our next item on our board is our approval. Approve the agenda as written. Second. So it has been moved by Mark and seconded by Martin. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by voting A or yes on the chat, please, or no or abstain. Okay, the yes votes have it with unanimous passing. That motion carries. Our next item on our agenda um, is audience time. It says Beth Grazer on here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm actually monitoring the Google form where if people can indicate their intent to speak comments. There are no regular comments for the intent to speak portion. We do have some for the public testimony regarding the facilities naming. So I can move right into that if you like. Okay, do you need to read the ORS first or can I just go ahead and get started? Um, I should read that just for procedure, just a second. Sorry, I have so many tabs open on here. I have to make sure I have the right one. Okay, audience participation statement. Public participation in board meetings is governed by policy BDDH. Visitors who wish to speak before the board must complete an intent to speak card available on the top of our district website and submit to the executive system to the board of directors, Roland Oman. Comments concerning a public agenda items are limited to its designated time, designated place on the agenda unless otherwise authorized by the board. Comments about non-agenda items will be heard at this time. Speakers should include their name and if speaking for an organization, the name of the organization. A spokesperson should be designated to represent a group with a comment. Three minutes will be allowed for individual comment. Five minutes will be allowed for someone who is commenting on behalf of a group. Speakers may offer objective criticism of district operations and programs, but in public sessions, the board will not hear comments regarding any individual district staff member. Commendations involving staff members should be sent to the superintendent. Channels for the board's review of legitimate complaints involving individuals include board policy KL public complaints. If appropriate, the board chair will connect the visitor with an administrator and receive comments regarding personnel. Any hearing conducted before the board regarding personnel shall take place in an executive session. The board thanks all community members for their presence and appreciates their input. Go ahead, Beth. All right. So, let me get it in here. Okay, we had a parent named Jesse Cox who wanted to comment on Ot Falati as being selected as the name for the new elementary school. She did not um, indicate one way or the other 
if that was one she liked or didn't like. So all it says in the comments section is Otfalati as a name for ES28. So I guess we'll have to add in our own assumptions as to for support for it. That's how I would take it, I suppose. Uh, Sarah Dennison is also an HSD parent. She says ES28 should be an easy name the kids can spell and pronounce. I recommend Sunset View. Sunset Ridge may seem too inclusive to have people believe it's only for the homeowners association residents only. Then we have a comment from community member Dirk Knudsen. I am the president of the Hillsborough Historical Society. I was one of the people who submitted submitted the name Hot Falati to be used for naming the new school. This is the seventh time over the past five years I have attempted to get recognition for the Otfalati people who inhabited the valleys and the North Plains region for tens of thousands of years. I have the support of many, many citizens and of members of the tribe, ancestors of the people who are in support of this name. Nowhere in Western Washington County are these people, the people of the land and water remembered. Hillsborough has come close a few times be in the Tualatin Valley has any forward facing remembrance and or naming to honor these people. In barns all around North Plains and Hillsborough, local farmers have hundreds of stone bowls, hand axes, arrowheads and pedestals hidden, oh, pestles, sorry, hidden away. They were here, thousands and thousands of them. It is decades overdue for us as a community to come together and finally honor them in a meaningful way. In fact, an elementary school has the potential to be the most meaningful place to do it. Working with the tribe, proper history can be taught and displayed in the school's lobby or elsewhere to honor the people. I teach a history unit in Hillsborough for Aranko and Quatama third graders, and my focus is always the native and pioneer history. They are enthralled, engaged, and hungry to learn more. The native rounds to collect food and to trade and care for this land are all lessons in sustainability. The Otfalati were peaceful, gentle, and people of great character. Who is better to teach our young people how to be than them? No one. Who better to be honored than them? No one. The most important thing in my life from my childhood was the native and pioneer unit we had in third and fourth grades at West Union. It was there that I learned about the native people, the pioneers and the way they lived. Holding a native pot and arrowhead in my hands at the marsh where Intel Ronla Rakers now stands was a mystical moment for me in 1973. There were signs of these people everywhere and as a boy, I could feel their spirits and hear their voices. There in the Reed Ancient Duck Pond, I found a connection to the land, the people, and the history that affected me deeply, changed me forever. If not us, who? If not now, when? There we go. Shoot. My, my screen is... Oh, there we go. There is not a name you could ever find more important and more fitting than Otfalati Ridge. We know that they were here, right in the area of the school and all around North Plains, the valleys and hills, and all through these environs. Next comment is from community member Jean Edwards. I support the schoolity as proposed. The sunset names aren't distinctive due to its wide use through the county and Beaverton already. Thank you. Next comment is from parent Gabriel Martinez. I would like the board to heavily consider Ridgeview Elementary as the name for elementary site 28. This name describes the location surrounding area of the new school site. It stands out as a name because it's not just another sunset school name like other schools in the area. And there is also no need to duplicate the name of the surrounding developer created neighborhood, Sunset Ridge. With this, I think Ridgeview Raiders or Ridgeview Railroaders would be a great mascot for the name and location. As a longtime North Plains resident, railroading has had a long standing history in North Plains. The train still runs through town several times daily and was one of the original railroad lines out west past Portland. We have many historians that speak of the railroad to this day. 
While I appreciate the quality name as it applies to the Tualatin Valley tribe, it should not be followed with the name Ridge. There are many other ongoing things to consider with the name Atfalati, such as people not pronouncing it correctly on the regular and having to follow guidance from Grand Ronde Tribe. Entry for ES28. Next comment is from David Lewis, <clears throat> community member. Dear North Plains community and Hillsborough School Board members, I am writing in support of the naming of your new elementary school as Atfalati Ridge School. The Atfalati peoples, also called the Tualatin, lived in the valley for more than 10,000 years and were unceremoniously removed from their lands and placed on the Grand Ronde Reservation in 1856. We now uh, we know that Principal Chief Kiakuts loved his land and people and wanted to remain regardless of white settlement because he went to the U.S. Circuit Court to defend his land title near Wapato Lake and won the case. We also know that the Otfalati had learned well the new ways of the newcomer settlers and were adapting to this agrarian lifestyle. They helped the settlers build and run the very good farmers by the 1850s, and so the removal remains an unnecessary travesty to this day. While they were paid for their lands in the Willamette Valley Treaty, the benefits they were promised to move to did not meet what the Indian agents promised them. They lived in poverty on the reservation for many years under federal administration. The Otfalati became leaders on the reservation and revisited their homelands each year, many becoming migrant farm workers for the settlers. Their descendants are tribal members today at the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and naming this school a place of learning after the tribe would honor them. And because nearly all of their original names were removed from their lands by the settlers. The return of this place name will be momentous for the Otfalati, especially when the school district further honors them with programs designed to teach students about their tribal culture and history. I fully support the naming of this facility as Otfalati Ridge School. And there are two left. Next is Debbie, who is in HSD, saying, I feel we should honor the people and their culture. Step outside the box. Finally, we have a comment from staff member Omar Rivera. My name is Omar Rivera. First off, I want to thank each and every one of you for the work you do for the Hillsborough School District. There we go. I also want to share for the sake of transparency that I am employed by the Hillsborough School District, but today I'm a citizen of Hillsborough. The opinions I am sharing today are my own and I am not representing the views of the Hillsborough School District. I had a whole prepared statement written down because I had a bit of fear that the importance of the name Otfalati Ridge would not be, I guess, realized. But I am just so thankful for the conversation you all had during the work session because it shows you all really care. I am thankful for the points that Erica, Yadira, and Martin made in being anti-racist and acknowledging on Martin's district celebrates white men with our current schools named after people. I am even more thankful for our student reps who give me hope for an anti-restrict with students who identify as a race ethnic around 50% according to district data, lacks representation in the names of our schools. The Hillsborough School District is a diverse and inclusive community, but why is it that half of our kids currently don't see themselves represented in something as simple as the names of our schools? But let me be clear, naming ES28 at Quality Ridge wouldn't justify the fact that the land the school would rest on is stolen land, specifically from the Kalapuya Native Americans and the Atfalati people, nor would it deserve to give ourselves a pat on the back. But what I am hoping is that Atfalati Ridge Elementary School will instead lead us down a road of honor, healing, and acknowledgement of our Native brothers, sisters, and siblings. And those are the comments. Thank you, Beth. So now we move into our action items in our agenda. And you, if you have it up, you can see that our first action item is our facility naming process. And I think we established what our process was earlier in our work session. So we're looking just for a motion and then we can have discussion. Madam Chair, <clears throat> I move that the Board of Directors select Ah 
Fallati Ridge as the name for ES-28 to be placed on 30-day review. Second. So it has been moved by Martin and seconded by Yadira. Is there any discussion? So please um, just type in your names. I can call you in that order. Uh, Jackie, then Martin, and then Chian. I want to thank the, the committee and the community members that um, went through a very lengthy process to come up with new names for our elementary school. Um, I just want to state from my perspective that at the beginning of this process, I made it clear that I was not a fan of um, naming a school after a people or person for many reasons. And I'm not saying in any way that our native community does not deserve to be honored. However, we need to be aware of what we're honoring and that part of the people and culture that we're talking about honoring by naming the school um, includes generational slavery of their own tribe members. And I think that that's something important that the community and that we need to take very seriously. Martin and then Chan. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, um, for those who are just now tuning in, um, we discussed this in two previous work sessions and there were also uh, extensive committee work. I wanna commend the district for a very thoughtful, uh, inclusive, deliberative um, engagement on this issue that was based on, on board guidance very early on. Um, I'm just really pleased with the process and, and I'm particularly pleased with the, the discussion that we had as a board and um, with these public comments, I think the public comments in total are sort of a microcosm of, of where we wound up. And um, it's worth noting this was, I think, the top candidate from the uh, committee that, that the district formed. And I want to state for the record that uh, we were very careful to um, seek the Confederated Tribe of Grand Ronde's endorsement of this name, and we have obtained that. And uh, I personally uh, support this as a way of honoring our our uh, our native appropriately, thoughtfully, and also to uh, demonstrate um, an intent on the demonstrate um, an intent on the part of this board to be anti-racist. And I view that this is within our board's purview. These are the kinds of things that we can do. Uh, we can make sure that the names of our, our Native American ancestors are actually verbalized. And then the comments that people have shared, I, to be honest, I, I missed the first work session, but for the work session earlier to this evening, I was very much conflicted um, in, between two names, um, Atalati Ridge and Sunset Ridge. and. Um, I think after hearing uh, some of the public testimony and even the, the wonderful dialogue and conversation that our board colleagues have had, um, I do support Apalati Ridge um, and I'm happy to support that. Um, the reason why I was conflicted is because, you know, a name carries so much weight, um, not, not just now in, in this moment, but for years and years. Um, to come. And the concerns that Jackie had raised, um, I think, are are very, very much valid. And and I, I agree that we do need to be very cautious, especially um, given some of the historic connotation. Um, however, I think that um, I think that as other board members and even many of um, the public testimony um, members have shared, I think this is an opportunity to to really educate and um, kind of seek uh, to understand more of the culture and the history of, of these people and to really honor them. And so um, I, I do support um, the Atkalati Ridge name. Thank you. Uh, Mark and then Yadira. Thank you. Uh, I too support the name Atfalati Ridge. I think uh, we're doing, um, I think we're doing the right thing. Uh, no decision is going to be perfect, but um, to me, the, the, I'm, I'm proud to support this name. Uh, no secret by anybody looking at the 
video stream that I'm a gray haired white guy. So um, I, I, I would just sort of the, the insistence that I keep coming back to of an actual full throated endorsement is uh, the history that gray haired white guys have of cultural appropriation. And I don't want this to be seen as a cultural appropriation moment. I want it to see, be seen as something that we work towards together. Thanks, Mark. Um, Yadira and then Lisa. Yeah, I just want to thank um, the board for the great discussion um, that we had with this naming process. And um, I fully support the name, um, especially because it, it is overdue and time um, to acknowledge the First Peoples um, uh, that settled in that you know, we're in this area and um, just acknowledging them and honoring them with naming a school um, after them, I think is, is really important. And it's gonna um, go a long ways to show our students and hopefully um, reflect them in um, how we uh, pay tribute to to the different people that, um, that contribute to the culture that we're trying to create here. So I, I fully support um, the name of Afaladi Ridge. Lisa? Okay, uh, thank you. I also um, am excited about where we landed um, with the name for ES28. Uh, I really appreciated the, the open and thoughtful discussion that we had and everyone sharing their thoughts. Um, that's why there are seven of us, um, so that we can have those thoughtful discussions and land in the right place together. So I think this was um, a, a really strong example for us as a team um, in making that happen. So I appreciated that. And then one thing I wanted to mention that we, we haven't talked about yet tonight is, you know, reviewing that survey data that is in our packet um, we had 892 responses to that community survey about the name for ES28. And of um, those responses, the, the name choice that we chose, Otfaladi Ridge, had the most positive, the most likes, and it also had the fewest dislikes. If you look at that page that has the bars, the gray bars and the blue bars. And so um, I think that we landed in the right place and I really appreciate that discussion because it helped me get there as well. But there is that support in the community. I think it's important that we highlight that. Um, and I just also, I agree with uh, you, Jira. I think you phrased it perfectly um, where you said it's overdue. Uh, absolutely, I agree. And so I'm, I'm excited about where we landed. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think it is. Um like I mentioned in our work session, just a, a sign of where we are as a board and that we're able to tackle a lot of these issues and have really respectful dialogue and conversation and grow as a board and also bring our community along in that journey and be transparent in our process. Um, so they all see where we stand and also um, that every decision that we make as a board, we don't make it lightly. We do our homework, we definitely have those thought-provoking discussions. And I just, I'm so appreciative of my board members for engaging in that conversation and doing it so respectfully and, and kindly. And um, I think, as I mentioned, looking back at our history of our country and understanding that from the beginning, everything that we did was built on slavery and that concept of racial slavery and that construct and how one, I think it's challenging to find um, any person or society that is not uh, complex and with a lot of difficult issues to grapple with. And here we are in the year 2020 dealing with that and our future generations are gonna look back on us and are gonna see these conversations, these discussions and how we landed here. Um, I think for me, what was so important is in the belief of becoming anti-racist is not erasing or continuing in the erasure of the people that were here before any of us were here from to support the name Atfalari. And I am thankful for all the discussion that we had and for the public comments and as well for the process that was well thought out, thought out and um, created a lot of opportunity for community input. So thank you everyone. Um, and there was a comment by Jackie, if we have full support from the tribe and Mike answered that, that we have verbal support indicated in our email 
but we will work to have more formal documentation for our board members. Um, so if there are no other discussions or thoughts, please uh, signify by voting yes or aye on the chat for our motion on the table or no or abstain. And if you're abstaining, please just type that also on the chat room. Oh, we'll just give it a. I think it's fine if we just pause a little bit and wait for her to log back in. I just want to make sure we have maintain our our process. There she is. If you just want to type in the chat so that we capture our, our process. I know you texted Lisa, but we want to make sure we maintain our, our process. She's on her phone. She may not have the ability to chat very well. I had to join on my phone. My computer crashed, so I don't have the ability. But I can, That's fine. I can tell you that my vote is no. Okay, thank you. So the yes carry the motion with six yeses and one no. That motion carries. Okay, and now that moves on for a 30 day review period. Our next item on our agenda is to accept, accept gifts and donations with Michelle Morrison. Thank you. As you can see per the situation page, we have a $6,000 donation from Sunrise Church to Reedville Elementary School and Witch Hazel Elementary School to be used uh, for technology peripherals and uh, school supplies for distance learning. And um, I, I just want to say that during this uncertain time and these, this, with all the challenges happening in the communities right now, that this is um, a gift and I'm proud to read it out loud for our meeting. So thank you, Sunrise Church. We would ask for you to accept the donation. I move that the board of directors accept the donation of six thousand dollars from Sunrise Church to Reedville Elementary and Witch Hazel Elementary. Second. Second. I heard Jackie, so it's been moved by Mark and seconded by Jackie. Any dis? Thank you. All those in favor, please signify. Oh, there's a comment on here by Martin and then Lisa. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted uh, every dollar that's donated to the district is profoundly appreciated, um, but it is truly remarkable, as as Michelle points out, that a faith community uh, was able to donate on that scale. Um, that's really amazing. And um, I just wanted to highlight, I think it speaks to the, uh, the relationship that Hillsborough School District has with the faith community all around in many um, in many faith communities um, and the richness of the of the uh, support we receive from the faith community generally in a, in a lot of ways is very appreciated. And they got their bags of supplies and it really, I think, made it feel like the beginning of the school year in a way that we would otherwise have missed. Um, and for that community, I think it was really meaningful and I'm sure that Reedville did something similar. Uh, and I think that it was uh, it was very appreciated. It was it was a huge turnout and people were really excited. So um, I know that um, all of the families in 
in at least my school community really appreciated it. I'm sure that the Reedville families did too. So thank you, Sunrise Church. Thank you, Lisa. And Jackie, I'm seeing the yes, it's a yes for the motion. So if any, uh, all my other board members, please uh, vote by signifying yes, I uh, no or abstain in the chat, please. Okay, we have seven yeses, the motion carries. Our next item on our agenda uh, was item number three, OSBA Board of Directors nomination, but seeing as we don't have any nominee from our board and we don't have any motion to nominate unless somebody changes their mind. <laughs> so I will move on to our next item, which is our resolution to refinance bonds with Michelle Morrison. Thank you again. Uh, we have a unique opportunity to refinance um, the original 2006 Series A and B bonds. Um, for the second time, we did refinance them in 2012. And whenever rates drop below, it's very similar to a mortgage. So whenever rates drop below a certain amount, it pencils out and saves our community um, their property tax collections if we can refinance. And so that's the opportunity we currently have. This refinance is actually on a fairly um, aggressive schedule with the, uh, there's gonna be a preliminary official statement circulated to you for review on the, scheduled to go out on the first and you'll have a few days to review that and get back to us. And then the pre-pricing is actually October and um, it's gonna move right into the sale quickly thereafter. So um, there's an opportunity to save $1.4 million to our taxpayers. Again, that is dollars that we just won't levy. So it's not operating dollars that we're gonna save, but it saves dollars to our taxpayers. And um, that's what we're here to ask for tonight is to uh, approve the required resolution to move forward. I move to approve resolution 0922 2020, the refinance of the 2012 general operation bond 2006 series A and B original issue, designating an authorized representative, delegating the negotiation and approval of financial documents and related matters. Second. Okay, so it has been moved by Sheehan and seconded by Yadira. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, board members, if you can signify by typing in the chat, aye or yes, please. Okay, the yeses have it with seven yeses. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Our next item on our agenda is our consent agenda. And I'm looking for a motion. I move that we approve the consent agenda as printed. Second. So it has been moved by Lisa and seconded by Adira. All the, uh, is there any discussion? Okay, we have a question from Mark. Yeah, hi, sorry I didn't get this in sooner and it's, it doesn't derail anything. Um, the, uh, just a point of clarification, the, the investment policy about the capital project fund, is this related to the current bond that we have, or is it just the thing that we always have and covers all the bonds that we ever do? This one is just capital projects. So, did, so is this policy a result of us passing a bond? And all right, the yeses have it. Um, we have seven yeses that Motion carries. Our next uh, reports and discussion. And the first thing that we have on here is our superintendent evaluation letter. Is that one that we get to read into our, our board? I'm looking at. 
rose for clarification. <laughs> yes, you get to read. Oh, okay. Let me just get to that space, sorry. I have multiple windows up, Rosa, if you can help me guide me what page I can find that. I'm trying to find our packet. Page 88 in the packet. Thank you. So the board did a uh, evaluation of our superintendent and this is a letter following our evaluation. And this has been vetted by our other board members and they have provided input. Um, so I will read our evaluation letter. Dear Superintendent Scott District, HSD, Board of Directors has completed your evaluation for the 2019-20 school year. According to policy CBG, evaluation of the superintendent this year's standards based model included a pre-evaluation survey completed by individual board members, your self-evaluation that examines your relationship, operational performance, and a new performance indicator for equity and cultural responsiveness. Your dedication to the HSD community is reflected in your every action and your commitment to serving our educational institution is demonstrated by your continuous improvement each subsequent year. Your 11 years of service has shown the stability we need in our community during this time. It is a pleasure of the board to evaluate your performance on the following nine standards. One, leadership and culture. Two, policy and governance. Three, communication and community relations. Four, organizational management. Five, facilities and technology management and planning. Six, instructional leadership. Seven, human resource management. Eight, values and ethics of leadership, and nine, equity and cultural responsiveness. The board used a four point scoring system with exceeding, proficient, developing, and does not meet as descriptors. The comments and data contained in the following evaluation reflect that of a leader who brings integrity and a commitment to understanding our community, along with a skillful approach to progress and advancing district initiatives. One, leadership and district culture. As the HSD superintendent, Mike exemplifies the kind of steadfast leadership that defines his role. Mike leads with an outstanding team of education professionals while contributing to a culture of service and collaboration. Mike cultivates relationships across all stakeholders from students and community members to city and state government leaders. While steering the organization through calm waters, Mike continues to seek out the areas of improvement and chart a course to higher success. But the true test of a leader comes during turbulent times, such as a worldwide pandemic and a national movement of protests against racism. Mike's poise, vision, and connection to the needs of the community continue to lead the district through these challenging and transformative times. Two, policy and governance. Mike is a natural and effective communicator who understands the value of keeping the board informed of legislative, fiscal, and pertinent general updates. He is open and flexible to changes that make the board governance role simple and straightforward. The HSD-wide policy update that spanned two years concluded this year and will be of great service to not only this board, but those that follow. Due to the significant updates to many of our policies, the board would like to see the impact and effectiveness of these policies. We will also need to develop a way to examine our policies with an equity, equity lens. Three, communications and community relations. This is the highest rated standard for Mike. Our board unanimously agrees this is an area that Mike continues to perfect. Mike is a genuine listener and has mastered the ability to listen to understand. We hope he continues to lead by example in, in this standard. His increased effort over the years to ensure our most marginalized voices are elevated and included in the decision-making process of our district is something this board encourages him to continue addressing. He effectively engages stakeholders and demonstrates a clear commitment to the community, the board, the district, and the, district, the district's partner agencies. Four, organizational management. The ability for Mike to lead the district through such dynamic times while preserving the fiscal integrity of HSD 
is a reflection, reflection of a leader with solid decision making and an understanding of community priorities. Managing fiscal constraints while finding innovative solutions is a critical requirement in this role. Mike has been able to lead his team through some tough decisions while aligning his decisions with the best understanding of the community and board priorities by facilities and technology management and planning. Future planning around facilities and technology management has been consistently increasing in importance for school districts over past decades. Skills in these areas were paramount with the passage of HSD's latest bond. While facing a significant capital asset and technolo technological project, Mike demonstrated his strategic decision-making and agility in incorporating the nuances of a changing landscape. He found efficiencies and opportunities through community partnership, community partnerships and made agile decisions for distributing technology based on the needs of the community. One significant accomplishment was ensuring every student had access to computer equipment and internet, internet access during the pandemic. Six, inst instructional leadership. This year, more than any other, Mike's ability to develop a vision and mobilize his team toward achieving while getting the support and advocacy of the board was on full display in our community as we transition to distance learning. From the programs and initiatives that Mike leads to the board's focus on equity, it is clear that he utilizes the community and the board to help influence HSD priorities. The district's record graduation rates are proof of Mike's success in leadership. Seven, human resource management. Mike's ability to cultivate a collaborative relationship with our unions over the years have proven to be essential at this time. The ability for HSD staff to be flexible and solution focused is due in large part to the culture in our district. Opportunities for professional development continue to be a priority to prepare our staff and deliver results to our students and families. Eight, values and ethics of leadership. This is the second standard at which our board unanimously scored Mike the highest. For our district to be effective, the values of our organization, community, and leadership must align. Mike brings his top tier conduct, reputation, and diplomatic nature to all decisions in his work. Mike consistently demonstrates the unwavering ethics and values that we've come to expect from him. Nine, equity and cultural responsiveness. For an institution to truly move the needle on equity and cultural responsiveness, it requires that organization's leader to not only share those values, but to also be courageous. The commitment with which Mike met the board's challenge to enhance HSD's efforts around equity is an example of that courage. Mike and his team, are leading the district on a path to become an anti-racist institution that not only stands up against racism, but takes corrective action to abolish it, its lasting effects from our institution. This path is filled with much difficulty and uncomfortable. Sorry, y'all, I missed my spot here. <laughs> This path is filled with much difficulty and uncomfortable conversations. Mike's willingness to engage in those conversations, as well as frame the problems our community is facing in this light, allows for progress down this path. We are encouraged by not only the work we see in public board meetings, but by his personal journey and understanding in interrupting racism where he encounters it. Superintendent Scott, we want to celebrate your commitment and length of service as superintendent at HSD. We acknowledge this year has been unlike any other and next year will also be filled with challenges as well as opportunities. This pandemic has created opportunities for us to be innovative, resourceful and transformative. We entrust you with leading us forward as we continue together on our shared mission. Gracias por todo tu arduo esfuerzo. Thank you for all that you do to make us all proud to be HSD. Thank you, Erica, and, and for the rest of the board. And I am just humbled to hear those words. And it, um, I really view these evaluations as not a individual evaluation, but an evaluation. And I'm sure all of our board members are gonna have a chance during our discussion time to also provide some feedback. Um, we're moving on to our next item. I think it's our last items under reports and discussion. Um, our financial report with Michelle. 
Thank you. This is going to seem really dull uh, compared with that. Uh, but I have written up our uh, monthly narrative, this first one for um, this year, and just a huge appreciation for the business office staff and uh, all of the other support staff that are working uh, during this really unique time and the creative uh, solutions that are happening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the narrative and the activities that we're looking at. Um, a side note from Leah McCarthy, our risk manager <laughs> in terms of incidents are down as well as workman's comp as of today. So there's some sunshine there. Um, for the first time ever in the actual spreadsheet reports, the cash flow reports, we do have an unaudited um, annual report for 1920, and we haven't shared that with the board before. So those numbers are likely to change from the comprehensive, um, the CAFR that we will bring to you soon. But this is kind of a sneak peek at the numbers for the general fund and how we uh, landed in terms of uh, savings, huge effort in the, at the end of the year for work share and it's reflected here in our fund balance. Um, so that's new. And then of course our first report for uh, this fiscal year doesn't include September's payroll, which is really the, the, the first domino to fall that will indicate to us where we might land at the end of the year. Happy to answer any questions about the financial report. Thank you, Michelle. I'm not seeing any comments, so thank you for that. Um, next item is our policies first reading. Mike. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a number of us that have policies here this evening. Um, mine really revolves around uh, the work of the board. So you'll see that there are three different policies here. There's BBAA, and that really speaks to board members' authority and responsibilities. And you'll see that there are just some minor changes there. Um, there's um, a wording on the first page, and then on page 65, you'll see uh, just a highlighted portion there, uh, really um, indicating that the board acts as a group. That's, that's where um, action can take place. The next policy is policy BDC, executive sessions, and that uh, speaks to uh, what can be uh, included in, in a, what is acceptable for executive sessions. And you'll just say, you'll just see some minor word changes there. And then the final policy that I'm bringing forward is the minutes of the board meeting. And that really is just a change in the legal references um, on the last page of that policy. Um, this is going on 30-day review, so please let me know if there's any questions that I can answer for you. And Mike, just a, a point of clarification, I know in the past, usually when we had some policies, we had a name of like a staff. Are these all just, so for these specific ones, if they have questions later on, it's for you. Uh, those These first three are for me, yes. Okay. I don't see any comments on here. We'll move to our next item. Um, and just to clarify, I don't know if I missed it, but did we also cover item E, 2E, or did you just do 2, uh, 1A and B? Uh, we do have some additional policies that are assigned to other folks. So um, do we want to have those people just at least share the titles of those? And yeah, that'd be great. I think I have uh, Casey on here for the last two. Yeah. The exact title um, I, I have those like on my packet, but I know one of them is um, with uh, unmanned air aircraft and drones. Drone, drones and then student transportation. And so the, the drone one is just minor. Um, wording to meet um, current uh, OSBA recommendation and same thing with the student transportation just some some minor rewording um, and to meet the most current recommendation from OSBA. I see. Uh, question from Mark. The, the drone one has like a so is all the stuff that's in gray is the new language right? Correct. 
so it's a quite a bit of stuff. Is that all just sort of OSBA compliant or? Yeah, it's government? compliant based on um, legislation that's happened over time. Yeah, the, the federal government's changing drone policies quite a bit over the yes. course of the last eight months. Yeah. Yes. All right. Uh, just a note that our own Jane Seguenz is a fully licensed drone pilot, so she's done all the certification. That's pretty cool. I have she drones. all the rules, too. And I, I have a drone and follow all the rules too, but I'm not fully licensed yet. So <laughs> yeah. that's how she gets all our nice videos for yeah. our bond project. All right. Thank you, Casey. Our next item is HCU and HEA reports. And they can just see it. We have our representatives on here. Yeah. Do you want me to go? I can go first. Okay. Um, well, okay. So we're in the week two of the CDL and wow, what an experience we've had. I am back at Lennox as a special education assistant and Debbie Langworthy is our officer on full release this year. And Debbie is a sped bus driver and she's also our bargaining officer. So she'll be getting ready for bargaining later in the school year. And we are happy that the union and the district were able to come to many agreements over the summer. Um, one of the one of the last ones was to avoid many layoffs, layoffs, and we're really happy about that. Several classified employees have been repurposed into different jobs. While they are helps and keep full benefits, many are feeling overwhelmed, and many are feeling that they are not receiving the training that they needed. They have been placed into different positions, and some have even been repurposed multiple times. Some have been placed into positions that require them to speak Spanish, that they are not qualified, that they are that they don't have that qualification, that they and they did not list it on their survey. Again, though, they are happy to be working though. So um, but I would like to speak about last week with the hazardous air quality and what we experienced and bring some information about how this impacted some of our employees, some of the classified. Most employees were directed to work from home if they could, but there were a good number that had to go out. We had bus drivers delivering lunches, maintenance and facilities that were out until they were sent home to work on safe schools. Uh, nutrition services were in their kitchens, but had no HVAC because the buildings would fill with smoke and they didn't have the proper masks to deliver the, bus, the lunch to the buses. And we also had SEAs and EAs that were passing out school supplies again until they were canceled but the lunch deliveries could not be canceled because our drivers are participating in work share. If the district stopped the delivery of lunches that would put these employees, that would put these employees over the 40% reduction in hours and they would not qualify for the unemployment benefits that they received by having their hours reduced and participating in work share. Many had to use sick time to stay home and many had to seek medical treatment as a result of working outside and are still under medical treatment. I understand that this is a result of the rules of OED and our hands are tied, but I wanted to share what was happening to some of the employees as a result of this program. I would also like to add that they do now have N95 masks that they are required to wear outside when the air quality is bad. But again, we are happy that the union and the district were able to reach an agreement to avoid all the layoffs like the other districts around us had to experience. So thank you. Thank you, Melody. And I see Jill is on here. Hi everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, okay, good. I, my, it's been sketchy tonight, so I've had to I've dropped it a few times. So hopefully, I'll um, stay with us, stay with you guys. Um, okay, well, being back with kids is awesome. Just want to say, um, but it has been very, very hard. Um, I wanted to just highlight. I sent out a survey over the weekend just to check in to see how members were doing because I had heard from a lot of them saying that while they loved being um, with their kids again, um, it's what we're trying to ask them to do is the hardest thing they've ever had to do, and it's what they've shared with me. And so I sent out a survey, and I sent it out Sunday, and I pushed enter about 1:30 Sunday. And before school started yesterday morning, I had over 300 of my 1,100 members that have responded to that survey, which tells me that they want to be heard and they were working on a Sunday, right? So, um, but I wanted to share some things that they said that were just awesome and very positive and then some things that we need to probably look at and collaborate. And I know I have OSP and HR that we're, re we're working together and we work together all the time. I heard earlier today, I can't remember if it was Mark, um, 
or Martin, but they asked about the CDL and the and the MOU with the hybrid. And right now we are really close to um, coming to a, an agreement around the CDL MOU. Um, we did ask as a union that we separate the CDL and the hybrid because there's just so much um, that we're trying to navigate. But the good news is, is we're close to um, coming up with an agreement um, with the district, the union is, and we um, we there's still things that we're going to have to address, but, and we know we will be doing that with OSP and HR. But some of the great things that I heard that teachers shared with me, and oh, by the way, I have um, in 48 hours, I've had 600 of the 1100 educators respond to my quick survey, just checking in and asking how last week went. So I just wanted to share that that with you. Um, it says kids have been great, um, parents have been great, and parents have, have worked hard to help their kids. Um, everyone in the district has really stepped up. Uh, the family meetings, the welcome meetings were a great idea and appreciated, and the opportunity to connect with each student and family before we started was great. And so I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, some things that they have asked me to, to work on as their union president is um, to really look um, student equity. Um, it was shared with me that there is a student that we have in our district who is um, navigating his daily education in a collapsible camping chair. And so little that's an example of some of the student equity concerns that, that educators have. Um, there's a concern about um, screen time for K2. Um, there's a struggle for the littles to navigate without parent support in the in proximity in the room. Um, class size concern for three through sixth grade. Um, class size for teachers who have had an increase of more than 100 students this year just because of the scheduling and the changes. That's typically at secondary with electives. Um, attendance, taking attendance has been overwhelming um, and needs to um, be streamlined and that is their words. Um, they asked that parents be a consideration that parents be surveyed again in the near future to check to see um, just truly how things are going. And um, they are, they're concerned about not receiving their first week of unemployment check yet. Um, those are just a few highlights. Um, I don't have, I know you guys don't want to hear me all night and I, and I know I don't have time to share more than that, but I want to end with um, that, you know, I really feel confident that OSP and HR um, hear me as their union president and they see me and we're working together weekly. Um, and I know that we will continue to work together um, to support our educators and teachers and provide the relief that they're asking for and that they need in order for them to stay well. And that's really important for me that they stay well. And that um, we give them the time, the prep and planning time that they need to prepare and provide exceptional lessons and classrooms for the Hillsboro School District students. Thank you. Thank you, Jill, and thank you, Melody. Um, and now we have discussion time. And first up, we have our student representatives. Um, and I'll just go down the list and see if you have anything um, that you would want to add. So let's go with Devlin this time, and then Yalom, and then Maya. I was looking at the order. And you can just say pass if you don't have any comments. Sorry, I, uh, I missed that. Did you want me to go first? Yeah. OK. Um, I, I wanted to talk, or I guess uh, something that I would personally like to speak about is the, uh, the naming process. I'm not, still not entirely sure how I want to say this, but I'm going to have to try anyway. But anyway, um, what I want to say is that um, I can, it, this is just, I, it's a really complicated well, it's not, I understand why we would, I think that we should bring more representation to our Native American population here. I just like to start that off. And at the same time, I can completely understand Jackie's reason for, um, I understand that it sounds like they, the Atflati people practiced slavery at some point, which admittedly, I think that is something that we should recognize when we're you know, we're naming something. We need to think about everything that goes behind that name because names are a really big deal. But what I would like to say is that there's slavery. We don't know everything about these people. I think that there's more to these people than just one 
practice, there was more to these people than just one thing. I mean, there's many people in our country that, you know, may have done some more reprehensible things. Like while we're on the topic of slavery, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, I believe they both own slaves and they still have places of education named after them. Lots of major stuff like that. But I just, what I think is that it's, there's more than just the slavery behind. I, I think there's there's a lot that goes behind a name, and I get that there may be some. I'm sorry, I'm still not entirely sure where I'm going with this. So, you're doing great. <laughs> doing great, Dylan. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, my um, all I'm saying is that I can I can understand both sides of the argument why we'd want to name the school. I, I agree with the representation, and I'm not about the slavery aspect of it, because that's something that I think this country is some kind of having to come to terms with. I mean, that, if anything that's been going on the past few months, that's something that we've been having to deal with to our history, not just well, race, but I mean, like, that's something that we're having to deal with. And I think it's good at the very least that we're having this conversation. And ultimately, I can see both sides of the argument. I just like to, for while we're, this is, this isn't permanent either. What's here isn't set in stone. We still have a, you know, a period where this is going to be on a trial period. I'd like to encourage the board members to take time and think about what the name really means and if we still want to continue in that direction. Thank you, Devlin. Uh, at home? Yeah, um, I just wanted to start off by thanking everyone <laughs> tonight um, just for respecting everyone's opinions, especially when we were talking about the naming process and just basically what Devlin was saying as well. Um, just being aware um, there's always going to be negatives to a positive. You know, we live in a society that's not perfect. And I think the overall idea of what we are trying to do is a pretty positive idea and like how I had said that there's always going to be controversy and as long as we have something to back up our decision um then I feel like we would be successful in naming the school after a Native American tribe um but yeah thank you um and then we have Maya Hi, I just wanted to start off by thanking everybody and especially for providing such a safe and um, safe space for vulnerable conversations. Um, I also wanted to say that it is a privilege to vote and the deadline to vote in Oregon is October 13th. So thank you so much. Great reminder, Maya. Okay, now we have our superintendent time. All right, thank you. Um, first of all, again, thank you for the uh, for the evaluation. I don't take that lightly, and I appreciate the time that you put into that. So, thank you very much. Much much appreciated. Um, I'd like to spend a little time just thanking our staff. Um, as you heard from both Melody and Jill, we we've had our opening, and that uh, opening. Uh, you know, we're we're working to pull off something that has never been done before, and that's you know, it's basically we're changing our instructional delivery model for nineteen thousand and five hundred kids. We're we're um, working to prepare uh, two thousand staff members to do that, and we're impacting ten thousand families along the way. So, um, just the manner in which uh, staff members have gone above and beyond on a regular basis to deliver what the students need, I'm just I'm I'm so appreciative of the staff that we have. I'm also appreciate, appreciative of the uh, families that we serve and the grace and compassion that they've shown as we've worked to overcome some of the bumps along the way. Um, it, is, we, it, it isn't perfect yet, and it's going to take some time to get this uh, leveled out, but we appreciate the grace and the compassion and hanging, there, hanging in there with us as we, work to, as we work to deliver the best possible instruction that we can. Um, I'd also like to just uh, highlight the, the discussion again that we had in the school naming process. Um, couple that with the Latinx Heritage uh, Month proclamation uh, that was done in both English and Spanish, as well as the Pledge of Allegiance uh, done in the manner that it was. Uh, we hear a lot about courageous conversations and the need for courageous conversations as we engage in equity work. 
and um, and we saw those in action tonight. Um, the conversation that we had in such a respectful manner to hear all sides of a of an issue, um, and engaging in those conversations in a bold and courageous way. I'm just so appreciative of of how that went tonight, and uh, know that that is going to serve us well as we move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and now it's our board discussion time, or board director's time. And I'm gonna just look at our um, alphabetical order and go the opposite way now this time. So we'll have Yadira Sheehan. Okay, well, you know, first of all, I just wanna start off by thanking, you know, the HSC staff, they've, been phenomenal like the first week of school i you know i had so much you know communication with my daughter's teacher and i was able to um, talk to her ask questions and i mean i felt like i had a direct line to communicate with her and i mean it's it's been great um, i've talked to parents from other districts and i'm really so proud of how hsd has um, has kind of taken this distance learning and, and really turning it into something that is uh, um, really meaningful and making sure that, you know, not only, you know, do our students have what they need, but I mean, teachers are really, you know, just going above and beyond as far as communication. I was so impressed with it. So I, I mean, really HSD is doing an awesome job. Um, so there was so much covered at today's meeting, and really, I want to stay, um, thank everyone that was involved in the discussion we had today. You know, the library program is awesome. I did not know that it had taken that long in the creation of it, but I mean, that just sounds amazing. So um, yeah, I, I I just think it's one, it's one of those meetings that afterwards I'm going to be really like thinking about everything that we talked about, and so um, yeah, but I'm I'm. I'm excited about the future um, and um, what um, what can happen with like distance learning longer. Um, but but I I am really proud of what we've done. So yeah. Thank you, Adira. Shan. Yeah. Well, I am happy to see everyone tonight. I missed you all at our last work session. Um, but first and foremost, you know, Mike, I just. I just want to appreciate your leadership so much. Um, I think the comments written in the evaluation is really just a fraction of, of the gratitude and the admiration of the work that you do. Um, and I also agree with you that we do have the best, best team and it really does take a village to, to pull off the things that we've done um, even in this last, even in this calendar year. Um, so thank you to everyone on this call. Um, I'm super excited to hear that there was such a high response rate with the family meetings and wondering if that's something that we could build in periodically um, as, you know, as the weeks go by just to check in to see how the families are doing. Um, and I appreciate Jill and Melody for really sharing, you know, what what the people on the, on the ground right now are, are experiencing and dealing with. And I have no doubt that um, we'll be able to work to kind of work out all of those kinks. So so thank you to um, just the leadership here represented on this call. Um, I also know that this wasn't discussed at today's meeting, uh, but I did hear the discussion that happened at the work session about the SROs. And so I do look forward to um, some of the upcoming discussions around that. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Shan. Um, next, we have Martin, and then Mark, you're on deck. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I've said this before, but every year it bears repeating. Uh, many of you know I'm 24 years in the Air Force, and I've, I've seen a lot of great leaders and a lot of great generals. And I just want to say, if if Mike had chosen to serve in the uh, armed forces, he would have been a general officer, and he would have been a great general. And uh, I, I concur completely with the magnificent an accurate letter that Erica read, and thank you. Um, and Jill, uh, you mentioned the word challenging uh, teaching, and I concur completely, and I 
I see that from both sides myself. My my daughter is uh, is a, a young mom, uh, and her daughter is in kindergarten. And I'm telling you, it's some of the most challenging parenting <laughs> that she's ever done. <laughs> and uh, and I might add some of the most challenging grandparenting that my wife and I have ever done. It was fun to watch my daughter coach my wife on how to be Rose's wingman at kindergarten. Basically, my daughter and the do- the mom and the grandmother were having to figure out how to keep up with Rose. And it was pretty cool to watch, but it's pretty challenging. Everybody's learning a lot of online skills and decorum about muting and unmuting. That was the big hurdle for my granddaughter to cro- cross is muting and unmuting. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned. Um, my thoughts also uh, in this new world that, um, you know, what's going to stay post COVID-19. I don't know that senior year attendance will ever be the same. I'm not so sure that we're always going to be in a CDL mode for seniors and maybe even juniors too. Um, That seems to be a good fit with, with um, that slice of our, of our student demographic um, to have that license to kind of live their life independently of the classroom. I don't know. We'll stay. We'll see. And I also wanted to give um, a highlight that there was a tasker to us from Rose in the last um, board update, the most current board update, and that is to review and consider a superintendent's committee participation. Well, we talked about one of them tonight, and that was the advocacy committee, but there are there are several other committees, um, and they're all fantastic. They're all hugely rewarding because you get to work closely with uh, a member of the cabinet and some of the superstars at the administration. And that's really powerfully rewarding. They do take a commitment of time. So I'd ask my colleagues on the board um, to be mindful of the commitment. And where I'm going with that is uh, the bargaining team participation. I I had the honor of participating in in the license last year. It was absolutely spectacular. One of the best experiences I've ever had working with um, everybody who came to those bargaining meetings and having an honest discussion about, about really substantive things was, it was amazing. It was a primer for me as a board member. And so um, there's there, there's one on classified and one on licensed. And full disclosure, I would love to do either one again. My work life allows me to attend those meetings during the day, but I don't want to foreclose the opportunity of one of my colleagues jumping on that. If if you think you can handle that commitment of those uh, workday meetings, please consider um, participating in one of those bargaining units. Um, it's a magnificent, magnificent and very meaningful experience. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hold off on signing up if it. If it goes vacant for a while, I'll raise my hand because I love it, but I don't want to crowd out anybody else from getting that that chance to work with Kana and Jill or Melody or all the people who come to those bargaining meetings. They're, they're great people to be in a room with for a couple hours on multiple occasions. <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Thanks, Len. Mark? Uh, to build on that, I served on the classified uh bargaining committee last time and it was like as martin said incredibly rewarding to get to work with all those people um and again i second almost entirely i'm happy to do it again i'm happy if martin and i want to switch but yes if somebody else would like to do it um i don't need to do it again right it's incredibly rewarding and, and if people have the time to do it um i wouldn't want to get in the way of somebody else having that tremendous experience uh so Glad to be back in schools. Thanks everybody to, to, to getting us to where we are. Uh, and thank you to Washington County for getting our numbers down a little bit. Um, we got a little, a little light over the horizon maybe. So hopefully we can not have a Labor Day spike and keep our numbers headed in the right direction. Um, really appreciate all the work that the 800 and something respondents for the naming, uh, survey did and all of the work that Casey did. Thank you leading that team on the um, on the naming for ES28. Uh, it, it could not have been easy leading that discussion. I appreciate your work and I, I really appreciate the work of all the community members. Um, feel, feel pretty good about where we landed. And I, I, um, I think Maya sort of put it very well that, that we have this safe space that we can have a very candid conversation and um, 
I think we all respect each other enough, cabinet, board members, everyone, to understand that the the genuine good place that our, our comments come from. Um, and yep, thanks, Mike, for everything. Uh, he's the only superintendent I've ever had. <laughs> and uh, your insights have been incredibly valuable along the way. Uh, and we obviously would not be the same district without your leadership and just thank, thanks to everyone, all the, all the staff, Mike, teachers, classified, all the classified people who agreed to be reassigned, um, filling out that survey. In, in, the, in the words of Ray Wiley Hubbard, the days that I keep my gratitude higher than my expectations are really good days. Thank you, Mark. Uh, then we have Lisa and then Jackie, you're on deck. All right. Um, gosh, um, I agree with you, dear. There's just so much to say that I feel like I'm not going to say all the things. Uh, I will try and start at the beginning. I already expressed how psyched I am about the library program. That is going to be so awesome. Uh, just, oh my goodness. And I, I couldn't be happier that that's happening. Um, I mean, I, I've already said a lot of this. I really appreciated our conversation in the work session. And I'm also really jazzed about um, the name that we have on 30 day review. I think that's the, the right choice for our community. So that's wonderful. Um, and I also uh, really appreciated hearing the, um, the thoughts of our student representatives. So thank you, Ilham, Maya and Devlin for sharing those thoughts. Um, that is um, part of why we are so um, enthusiastic to have you here um, because you have um, perspectives that we may not consider if you weren't here. And so I really do value that and appreciate that very much. So I wanna thank you for that. Um, I, I said in the chat and I'll just repeat that the advocacy committee is a super rad committee and you should totally be on it. Um, it's like one of the best committees, um, in, in real life when we're not in fake pandemic land, uh, you also get to go in person to like Salem and lobby and stuff, which we can do with OSBA, but it's, it's cool. Uh, I don't have the bandwidth for that, like I said, so I, I won't participate this time, but, um, I hope to participate again next time. And I hope that you all sign up, three of you at least, because it's it's a great committee and I would hate to see it um, wither away. Uh, Mike, um, I know you love the uh, positive attention and everybody talking about how great you are. And yes, Martin McCool's committee is the audit committee, um, but you are so fantastic. And it's so awesome that every year we get to publicly embarrass you by talking about how much we adore having you as our superintendent. So I'm gonna just take the opportunity to do that a little bit more. We hear all the time how jealous people are of our superintendent because you're amazing at leading our district. And we are so blessed to have you in our district and stay in our district for so long because I think that's part of what makes you so incredibly effective. Yes, you have a high level of ethics and yes, you care deeply about equity and yes, you are super diplomatic, but if you hadn't been here for over a decade, you would be far less effective. And so we just really treasure having you stay here in Hillsboro for as long as you have. And we know that you'll never leave us ever until you retire. And so we're just so happy about that. Um, and, and just uh, thank you. Um, I know that, that we all appreciate you very, very much. And then the last thing I'll say is, um, this beginning of the year uh, in the last week and change has been just overwhelming, I think, for staff and for students. And we all know that. But, but I think that we really have made the best of it in Hillsboro. Um, just I know that for my students, they have been really excited to go to school every day and their teachers have been so wonderful and they felt connected with their classmates in a way that I wasn't expecting um, them to feel. So I think that we've really made the best of a bad situation and I am really impressed with the work that um, all the staff has done to make this as, um, as smooth as it possibly could be. That being said, I cannot wait to have my children leave the house and go to school and be there in person and Yadira agrees with me, we cannot wait. So uh, we're, yeah. We're excited to have that happen. Uh, but I really do think that we have done, we, I've had no part in making it, but I'm gonna say we have done just a fantastic job in making it um, a, a pretty pretty solid start for CDL. So um, so great job team with that. And, and that's all. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Lisa. Jackie? Okay, Mike, yeah, I know. <laughs> he's, he's, he's secretly cringing, but 
your leadership and mentorship and support of the board and the district is um, above reproach. I mean, it is phenomenal. Your quick response time, your communication, it's all in the letter. I won't go much deeper, but we we couldn't be as effective as we are without your guidance. Um, and the HSD staff, boy, you guys made the impossible possible. Um, I know there's bumps in the road and we're still figuring it all out, but your dedication is what is making this distance learning work. Maya, you're right. Today is, I believe, National Voter Registration Day. So, sorry, Lisa, <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> so please, if you're not registered to vote, vote, do so. And then remember to vote and vote early, please. So um, I also want to, to my fellow board members, I appreciate the team that we are in that, like Martin said, he's able to have a flexible work schedule to do bargaining and spend time on the committee, whereas I may not have the flexibility to do that. So I think that we work well as a team being able to cover everything that we need to be at and do and be responsible for, while also keeping everybody informed of what we're doing. So I want to thank you all for that. Um, that's it. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I just wanted to make a point maybe to for us to think about Mike as well. Um, I think hearing that comment, and I've heard it before from Jill, about just the learning at home for families and how it is a challenge um, sometimes to have even a desk or a surface space for some students to have that in their, in their home. And as we think about just our partners and either the faith community or nonprofits or whatever it may be to that we can kind of say, here's a need if anybody is, you know, wanting to help us in that area. Um, I think that's that's another um, way that we can work around the equity issues in learning spaces um, at home. Um, the other thing, I, I think that just for our board to, and for our audience that we have, whenever they kind of listen to our discussion, I think one of the things that in this microcosm of a, of our board work and in our little world that we have here, we can provide an example of having healthy discourse around really complex issues and really bringing our bringing our thoughts, emotions, and, and opinions to the table and being vulnerable and having those discussions and still remaining respectful and valuing each other's opinion. I think that's something that's a challenge in our country as a whole right now. And the more that we can demonstrate that behavior in our governing board and also as examples to our student representatives that you can do this work well and you can do it um, working and respecting others different opinions and this is just a little slice of this work in our little board but there's also other places in our community where this is happening whether it be city councils or board of commissioners and any space that you might think later in the future you as student reps you might want to engage in that hopefully you're getting an example of how you can do this work effectively and it's upon us as board directors and adults really as continue to set that example of being in that growth mindset uh, so i thank all of you for your work um, and i also just thank all of our staff for their flexibility it cannot be easy to have to learn a new job and then to change, um, it, it's hard. Uh, I've been through that and I think we've all had that first time job, um, but I can only imagine how hard it is to have to do that and um, be flexible. And, and I know that everybody that shows up to do this work is because they truly do love our children and they wanna do the best to provide them an education and a good one at that. So I just wanna thank you for all of your work that you do. And with that, our meeting is adjourned with one minute over. I'm so proud of it. Thank you.